How are you doing? Good, dude. How are you? Very good. I'm I'm so excited to talk to you today. I'm I'm glad we got a chance that you got a chance to find out what was going on. Yeah, a lot a lot has gone on since we last spoke. I think that was what? That was February or March? Yeah, it was pretty early on, just after you moved to Vegas. No, no, I moved last year. It was earlier this year. I moved last March. Oh, okay. It was, yeah, a year. But, uh, it, was uh, it was either February or March. But yeah, a lot has happened since then. Before we get into it, because uh, Boston still hasn't joined, I just want to do some housekeeping really quickly. If you okay. Don't um, I wanted to show the guys something. Well, first of all, I wanted to tell people that haven't subscribed to Boston's forum. This is the forum. It's bigdaddyb.com slash members. Highly recommend people to subscribe. A lot of people, it's actually really cheap. A lot of people book consultations with me and then ask about sources and different things like that. I really think it's better for people to go to the forum if they haven't already. That's the first thing I want to do. The second thing is I want to show you guys on my website. If you look at book, book a consultation under here, because we got a question about interesting biomarkers and blood tests. If you look here, I have a list of biomarkers that are sort of general from one to 27. And one of the questions we got this week was uh, somebody asking, like, this is too many biomarkers. It's expensive to, cal to test. So I wanted to show you guys an oral glucose tolerance test. You, you really want that if you have insulin resistance or diabetes. You may not need that. What you may also not need is 12, 13, uh, 17. These are all a little bit specific to the cardiovascular system. And then 22 to 26 are the most reliable markers for cancer. I went through an exhaustive series. By the way, actually, you might be interested in this, Dominic. Uh, I'm sorry, I, was, I was actually testing. What was the biomarker for cancer? You caught me. Oh, no, take your, take your time. I was just going to show you 22 to 26 on my website. If you go to the website and look under book a consultation, you'll find this list of biomarkers. Okay. 22 to 26 are the most evidence-based cancer biomarkers that you can test in your blood. I'm actually really interested in doing that because I was wondering which ones would be ideal for that. Yeah, now some are, are specific to certain cancers, like alpha fetoprotein is um, particularly raised with liver cancer, um, uh, prostate-specific antigen, as you know, prostate cancer. Um, but the CA-1919, CA-125 are pretty general, and the CAEA is particularly useful for colorectal cancer. Mm. But these may be a little bit expensive for people to use. So I just want to mention yeah, the, the MDA, LA, LDL, LP, PLA2, and the MPO you may not need. Lipoprotein little a, you may want to test it once in your lifetime. OGTT, you may want to do once every few years when you're suspicious. And you may not need all your hormones if you're not interested in that subject. But the rest are quite informative. I won't go through all of them now, but I just want to let people know. This is on the website. If you go to leonlongevity.com slash consulting, you know, you don't book a consultation, but you can use this the list of biomarkers to guide you. Interesting. I don't. I wonder where Boston is. He's usually not... Uh... Oh, he says get on now. So what, other, other than what happened to you, how's Vegas? How, what's new in Vegas? Uh, you know what? Uh, nothing's really new here. I mean, they lifted like the masks and stuff like that in May. Um, last month, they brought the masks back. Um, but that's really it. Other than, oh, we spoke before Flex's gym was open. Flex Lewis's gym is now open, the Dragon's Lair. Yeah. Um, do, do you live near it? I actually live like 15 minutes from it. No way. That must be yeah. an excellent gym, huh? No, oh, it's, it's awesome. Machinery is great, but the environment is what makes it what it is. I mean, everybody there is just, eh, you walk in, there's no egos, you know, and anybody that has a bad ego, bad attitude will be showing the front door real quick. Um, but everybody there is, you know, friendly, everybody's real supportive of one another. Um, and you do have a pretty serious crowd, even if people aren't competitors or whatever, they could tell they're there to, to train, you know, it, it's a cool environment. I hear Flex takes like particular care with his gyms. Like if like like you like you said, if one guy there is not acting well, you'll ask him to leave. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. He uh, you know, aside from like I said, the place being very clean, uh, all the machines are kept up after, the staff there is really good, but the environment there is just is just is phenomenal. But I know you haven't been feeling well for most of the time you've been in Vegas, but now that you're feeling a little bit better, what in the world do you do in Vegas? Because I know you're not going to the strip. So I'm curious, what do you guys do for fun? You know what? The last few months, I've really just been focused on getting better, um, working. And I've actually been traveling a lot the last few months with my girlfriend. We've been going to uh, different shows. Uh, she's from Fort Lauderdale. So back in June, we were there for a couple of weeks, came to here, um, went to USA's. Then we went to Fort Lauderdale for a little bit. And the Tampa Pro came back here for a little bit. 
And then uh, we just recently went to the North Americans and then we're back here. So yeah, just been like traveling a lot. Honestly, there isn't much to do other than, you know, if you want to go shooting or stuff like that. I mean, uh, to be honest, Leo, there really isn't that much to do. <laughs> That's what I was thinking, right? Because yeah. it's sort of like densely concentrated on the strip. And then it, otherwise you're sort of in desert. It's like it's sort of like Reno in a way outside of that area, you know? Yeah, it's, I mean, like I said, I mean, there's some nice places to live. I live in a good neighborhood. But in terms of things to do, there really isn't anything. <laughs> it's not like the kind of place you go to get work done, to focus, isolate, and work on your goals and move forward. Yeah, you know? I mean, that's if you have them, if you don't have a party mindset. Like, if you want to just go get drunk or do drugs or go around a bunch of strippers or, you know, go nuts, it's not the place for you. But <laughs> if you really just want to get to business, like, there really isn't anything else to do here. You know, it's it's... I like it in a way, but, you know, I don't know. I'm, I'm still feeling the place out. How's your coaching been? I mean, I know you've been busy with your health condition and stuff, but were you coaching people at the USA's and North Americans? USA's, I didn't have anybody. I slowed down with taking clients on from May till about late July, August till my mental, because April, May, and June were the worst mentally. Before that, it was still no bargain. But I was like, all right, now I know what it is. I'm going to get this fixed. So I slowed down with taking on new clients. Um, USA's they didn't have anybody, but in North Americans, I had a 55, uh, uh, 54 year old heavyweight who got his pro card. He looked pretty good. Jeff Snyder. Wow. Um, but yeah, I have a ton of people that are competing within the next five to all the way up to nationals in December. For the audience that doesn't know, and I don't remember, where did you win your pro card? Uh, nationals 2014. Okay. Yeah. That was a stupendous showing of people want to, I saw the pictures really, you're really fine. Now you're, st I've, you're still very young. So you're, I've heard that you're planning a comeback as well. Yeah. I'm 28. I didn't know you were trying to do When we talked before, I never knew that you were going to compete as seriously on stage again. Oh yeah. No, I moved here to get away from New York to, yeah. Like we just spoke about to get, uh, you know, into serious business. You know, I wanted to be surrounded by like-minded people and, you know, just be away from New York, new environment and, but then the health issue started last year and I wasn't able to make any gains whatsoever. So now that I'm getting better, um, you know, God willing, within the next month, two months, I can hopefully start to push things. I'm back to training now the last two to three weeks. Um, I can train without losing weight and I feel good. And um, I'm a bit tired today. I pushed it hard yesterday and today. And um, But yeah, hopefully next month or two months, I can start pushing things and growing and hopefully get on stage next year. Yeah, I'm, I'm really anticipating Boston joining because I really want to talk about the details of it. Like the losing weight while lifting while lifting was very, that's very interesting. But we'll hold off until he comes because I, I think he'll want oh, to. Oh, I could. We're going to go really, in, really in depth with this one if you guys want to because I have so much to share on this subject. Yeah, I mean, to introduce the issue, like for, for people to realize, you know, if you go to a doctor with a, with standard conditions, they don't like test you for parasites and fungi. And, you know, there are thousands of, of viruses that we don't even know what they're called that are in sushi and in everything else, for example. And we may have viruses that cause us issues or fungi or bacterial infections and don't know about it whatsoever. They're hard to test for. And this subject, heavy metal poisoning, is similar. Like nobody would, would think to check for that. Like when we talked about originally, you described your symptoms, which we'll get into later, but your symptoms could be from some other source, you know? And we were trying to address the symptoms, but we didn't know the cause. Yeah, so it's incredible. It's, it speaks to your investigation uh, ability and your tenacity that you figured it out. Yeah, that's the thing. Doctors, regular doctors don't recognize it, at least here in the United States. In Europe, they do. Um, but yeah, here they don't. And I would hope I would think they would with all the environmental toxins that are you know, in the environment mm. and, you know, in foods and whatnot and vaccines, which we'll talk about. Um, but yeah, they just don't recognize it and things get misdiagnosed as other issues. Wait, before we do, since Boston's here, I wanted to show Boston something before I finish showing you guys stuff on my computer. So today, so last two weeks ago or so, Boston, remember we got a question about Logan Franklin's face changing? Yes. And people were like, is that abusive steroids? Well, a lot of people were commenting on that video saying, apparently, like, there are cosmetic procedures that people can do to do that. So I didn't know much about this. So my wife, <laughs> my wife found this incredible Instagram, okay? This guy's called Dr. Zakali. He's in London. Now, these are women, but like, it's very interesting to see the male. If, I didn't know, bro, that this is possible. Uh, let's see. Let's find a male. You would never know that some that this guy's done something to his face. These oh, are no. literally injections, not a surgery. No, you really think he did that? Bro, this guy's very famous, apparently. My wife was researching. So well, no, I know it's a thing, but do you think Logan Franklin did that? Oh, no, I don't know about that. I was just, I just thought this is, I don't, I didn't notice a change in his face, but I don't know it really. But look at this crap. 
Isn't that crazy? Yeah, they could do anything these days with injections. Dude, there's so many chicks on, like, Instagram that completely, like, but you notice they all start to look the same after a while? Like, That's the, what the, my the, wife said. My wife's, that. but I, I noticed that about girls, right? They start to look like they're all they one all version. Of, look. But the thing is, my wife was saying that's why men are starting to look alike now, which I didn't notice myself. Yeah, that's pretty. That's pretty fucking feminine, if guys. Yeah, men that. men don't talk about it, but a lot of guys are, are doing a ton of injections to their face. In <laughs> bodybuilding, really you think? Crazy. I bet you. I bet you. A bunch of men's physique guys are doing that shit. Oh, I mean, a lot of them wear makeup, so I wouldn't doubt if they're. You know, oh, I know they wear the makeup. I I was backstage one show and I saw that shit. I was like, wow. Look at this guy, Zach. So we share a knee doctor, actually, me and this guy, Zach Efron. So apparently he has, look at his face. So this guy's commenting on it. Is it overdone? He's basically insinuating that it's injections. Anyway, I found this unbelievable. I didn't know this was possible. Look, look at this crazy stuff, bro. What the hell? What exactly are they putting in them, Leo? I think they're different formulations. Some are like collagen. They try to get something that's uh, digestible. But the thing is, you guys are used to injections. So think about it this way, right? If you get a tiny injection here that puts in a noticeable mass, wouldn't scar tissue develop around that mass slightly? You know, when you get like an injection bubble, you get a little bit of, you get like this kind of, I don't know what they call it, but you know, you get that bubble. I assume if there's... If they're injecting the same area a lot, probably. Yeah. I don't think it's going to form scar tissue unless, like Boston said, they're injecting it, you know, over and over, which they're really not with some of those fill It's it's fillers. It's different than like Botox and stuff like that, but they're doing like collagen, hyaluronic acid and the Juvederms and stuff like that. They use hyal hyaluronic acid also? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. That's a big one. They, they That stuff, man, it's crazy what they wanted to charge my mom for shit like that. They, they make they make so much money on doing that stuff. Oh, yeah. yeah, they do make a lot of money on that. That's you can crazy. get... Um, a syringe of Botox, you know, for underground, whatever you want to call it, like, you know, black market for like $30. And then they'll sell it for like six, $700 in that's the, the uh, wherever you get it. That's the stuff that I got from my mom. <laughs> yeah. I was, I was about to say Boston did that. I got it from my, I've been doing it for my mom and she loves it because she was paying $2,000 to get it at the place. So I go on Alibaba, right? Al, you guys know what Alibaba, AliExpress, yeah. and I bought the same shit for forty dollars, and I did it. I did it myself because I, I. It's all on YouTube. That's you crazy! Did, oh my god, you did that yourself? I'd be afraid to do that. Well, Dumb she it. wants me to do her lips now, and now I'm like kind of a little afraid about the lips. Yeah, I wouldn't do that because I knew <laughs> this, uh, this guy back home, back in New York, and his girlfriend. Uh, you seen throughout the throughout the years, her lips. She was obviously getting her lips done, and then he started doing it for her. And it was just, it was really bad. Yeah. Some of them infected and everything. No, the yeah, worst part is it gets lumpy. Yes, that's how this girl was. It was huge and lumpy. So, but so, Boston made it just good. It's easy to get infected in the lips. You got to do like, I was watching on YouTube, you got to do like literally 12 different areas on the upper lip and the lower lip to get it even. Like that's so much injecting and it's like an hour process. I don't want to do that. Yeah, but this is what this is what happens, right? They start to get like the the middle stays tight, but this part starts to get droop, right? So they get like two sides of droopy when they've injected for like five years straight, and then they didn't inject in a while. You find these like loose lips that are like a bit loose here. I don't know if you guys have noticed it. Like the the shape of the lip changes. It's like it gets stretched out or something. The the stuff I got for my mom was called Dye Sport, which I guess it's like a better Botox. Yeah, and then I also got Sculptra. You, I don't know if you heard that. It's a, that's you put the sculpture in your hair and then you put the dice board up here. My thing would be if you're injecting like your cheekbones constantly and like your jawline, wouldn't over time, say 20 years, wouldn't it just start to sink? So you'd have we'll like see, this. We'll see because this is a new procedure. So we'll see when they're older. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Oh, the other thing I wanted to mention before we get started, uh, Devin Larat's fight, just for the audience before they correct me, is actually on September 18th. Oh, do you know what we're talking about, Dom? No. So there's there's a guy called Half Thor Bjornsson from Strongman. Do you know? Oh, him? okay, yes, I know who he is. So he had a title or not a title fight. He had a fight with uh, another strongman, Eddie Hall. Guy, Eddie Hall, and Eddie Hall ripped his bicep. So a guy from my world, the arm wrestling world, Devin Larat, is now fighting Half Thor. I was wondering what happened with that the the uh, Eddie Hall fight him. Yeah, but the thing is, I thought obviously they delay the fight. They didn't. It's still on September 18th. So Devin must have had like a month to prepare or less than that. And he's an arm wrestler. That's a retired military guy. So he's not in cardio condition. So I take back like even before when I was saying he might not win, 
he's saying in, in his videos that like he's very unconfident. <laughs> he's saying, I'm going to go get knocked out and come back. But uh, the thing is, he's a tricky guy. So I don't know if he's if he's trying to like let half Thor underestimate him. And that's that's on the 18th, Leo. And do we have to buy that on our computers and plug it into our TV? Or is yeah, the I'll send you the link like uh, two days before. Okay, cool. Yeah, yeah, I'm very excited for it. That's very exciting. Oh, did you did you did you see the arm wrestling match I sent you? You, I, I haven't seen it yet. I just saw that, but I will after. I'm curious because that one is is cut down to two minutes. I'm curious if you find it boring or not. Yeah. It's about a recent match. Yeah, because the arm wrestling looks boring to some people that haven't done it before. You know. Anyway, Dom. So, tell us the whole story. You know, the, just for the audience to know, my background is well. I've had Dom on the show before, and you know, he was suffering from from uh, psychological symptoms like last year. And Dom has do, done extensive research. Originally, he figured out that it may be gastrointestinal. And that's when I last heard from you. And then you've done even more research. So maybe you can give the audience a background. Yeah. So basically, I mean, it really started. I'll never forget. I was in Venice, uh, November 2019. I noticed, you know, I had some stomach distension and my bowel movements were changing. I didn't think anything of it. This went on for months. Um, last year, last March, I moved to Vegas. Uh, I've been a big fish eater my whole life. And, you know, I'm eating at a different sushi place every night and a lot. Well, you've been eating fish at home when you were a kid? Uh, I've been eating sushi since I was a kid. Yeah. But even oh, wow. when I was a kid, you know, I mean, it was like shellfish and stuff like that, but not like whitefish or anything. But even when I was a teenager coming up in bodybuilding. Uh, but anyways, last June, you know, I get back in the gym after the quarantine and the stomach is just getting real bad. I'm really bloated. And then I'm like not getting any pumps at all in the gym. I'm like, what the hell? My joints are killing me. So this went on all last year. Went to gastrointestinal doctors. They were telling me, oh, it's steroids. Is this is I'm like, no, it's not. Yeah. Didn't even bother with them. I just kept eating fish, not realizing what I was doing. So this year comes and, you know, um, the depression was horrible. It was on and off depression. I couldn't focus on anything. My memory was going. Um, I felt like at, at times it just disconnected from my body. Um, I had like suicidal thoughts. Hey, wait, did you have that depersonalization kind of disorder where you feel yes. you're outside yourself? Oh, yes. you got all the way there. Wow. Oh, yeah. Oh, it was, wow. it that's horrific. Bad. Uh, the suicide of thoughts. I remember I would just be sitting on my couch and like a thought popped in my head. I'm like thinking of ways to do it. And I'm like, wait, what the hell? Like, what's wrong with me? I would never do this. Why am I thinking? I'm like, do I really need to say a psychiatrist? Yeah. Anyways, uh, February, I hooked up with a gut specialist that actually worked with Flex Lewis. Wait, another um, symptom you didn't mention to the audience. You always had brain fog, right? Like it was oh, difficult yes, to think yes. from the top down. The brain fog, focus issues. Um, what other issues did I have? I mean, sir, I know I had problems with uh, my sex drive was like on and off. And anxiety um, as well, right? Yeah, slight anxiety. Nothing crazy. That was the weird part. There was no crazy anxiety. Interesting. Yeah, it was odd. But uh, I wasn't, like, I couldn't really get angry either. I couldn't get angry. Um, I couldn't get worked up. It was just, like, I was constantly just, if I, was, if I wasn't if I was low, I was, like, very neutral. You know, mm -hmm. it was a very weird feeling. Interesting. Interesting. Um, so, anyways, I hooked up with him. Uh, from I came off cycle completely. PCT, um, I didn't eat anything off my diet from, uh, I believe it was late February till May. Um, now, mind you, I didn't realize I wasn't eating fish, but I felt amazing during this period. However, I shrank down like I've never shrank down in my life. I went down to 230 from 270. Mind you, the 270 was extremely bloated. It wasn't a healthy 270. That's when you spoke to me and you said you're feeling way better and it was the gastrointestinal. Yes. Interesting, it's because there was no fish. <laughs> okay, interesting. That's right. Yes, I was feeling really good. Um, you're still I, eating fish? You're still I, eating no, fish? No. No, I, no I, the last time I ate sushi was, actually I ate it once in March, and then before that was in January. Oh. So I stopped. I went from eating it every day to none at all. Yeah. And I started feeling off cycle. I was feeling great, but I lost so much fucking weight that I was, I seemed, I became like a string bean. I knew something was wrong. So I thought, all right, maybe my body's just cleaning out or something. Awesome. Um, Anyways, May comes, I get back on cycle. Normally I get back on cycle, I blow up like you, every day I change. Pumps come back, uh, I start adding weight. I gain 10 pounds, I'm noticing I'm not getting stronger, I'm actually getting weaker. Um, I started feeling even shittier, which I think was, you know, taking gear messes with the detox pathways that allows the mercury to come out. Mm -hmm. um, and now there was like back to square one. So I'm like, what the fuck? Like, you know, I'm not growing. I'm not getting stronger. I feel horrible every time I train. Like when I train, I, if I trained hard, I would lose like three or four pounds overnight, sometimes like seven or eight. Would you be and extremely I'll, exhausted after you train? Exhausted for days, for days after. 
Mm. And like, I would just sit on my couch all day and just, just to even pick up my phone and read like client text messages and think was like, a, it was exhausting. Just for the like, audience to know it, when you go, when you lift, when you're strong like Dom is and you lift heavy in a workout, you increase oxidative stress in your body heavily for a few hours. That's why most people lift heavy, like feel sleepy after, or they can't focus. They have a bit of brain fog, but Dom had, as we'll find out, heavy metal poisoning, which one of the main effects is oxidative stress across the body. So you get like super oxidative stress, I assume. Never yeah, had so it. it's funny you say that too, because when I did train, I noticed I would I was getting severe bags in my eyes and they were very dark. Wow, interesting. Yeah, so, and then if I took a couple of days off, they went away and people were like, oh, your skin looks great. So I was like, what the hell is going on? Um, so in May, I start working with Flex Lewis's massage therapist and, you know, doing a deep tissue. And she's like, are you eating? I'm like, yeah, I'm eating as much as I ate when I was at my biggest years ago. It's not doing anything. She's like, it feels like you haven't eaten in months. She's like, something's wrong. It, it just does not feel right. And I told her, um, I did a Genova testing in March, uh, which stool, urine, and blood, and my mercury was elevated. Wow. Nobody really thought anything of it. But when she said this in May, I'm like, okay, something's wrong here. I think this is it. Because I had all these ideas of insulin sensitivity, this, this, that. And I actually contacted Jason Hu, who I knew who had mercury poisoning years ago. And he's like, you have it. He said, go to a functional doctor, get a, a provoke test with a chelator, and I guarantee it's going to be off the chart. And what do you know? I went uh, first week of June. They gave me the DMSA capsules. I did the urine test, and it was like off the charts. Yeah, just for the audience to know, what, he, what, he's, what Dom is referring to is a test where they, they give you a challenge to get you to release some of the stored heavy metals. Yes. Then they check your, I guess, urine, right? Yeah, so um, say, for instance, I'll never forget, it was a Sunday. I woke up. I took the sample of the pre-test. I took the five pills. It was 1,250 milligrams of DMSA, which is a chelator, uh, very high dose. And then I peed in a jug over six hours. At the end, mixed it up, threw it in the fridge, mailed it out to the lab, and then it comes back. That's a challenge test. Fascinating. So, so the the, diff, the reason why we're mentioning this is because normally on a blood test, you'll just find out your mercury level in your current bloodstream. But if you, for example, maybe I assume if you ate fish for like 10 years straight and then stopped two years ago, you're going to have a lower amount in your bloodstream, but some reserved in your body, which okay. you can, right? Yeah, correct. So blood work will show recent exposure. And even though it was like two months that before, two months of no eating fish, it was still very high in the blood test. So I can't imagine how high it was even when I was eating fish. How yeah. much fish were you doing a day? So, okay. So I always was big with sushi. Either it was like one to four times a week in place of a meal at night. It would have been like 20 pieces of white tuna sushi or yellowtail, just protein and rice. You would never think anything of it. Um, but when I moved to Vegas, I was doing it about five to six times a night to start because you have all these oikini sushi places here. <laughs> um, and then last June, I was I, I got really lazy. So I'm like, you know what? Let me just eat tuna packets. Fish always got me big because in preps, all I ate was fish. So I was doing anywhere between eight to 12 ounces of tuna two to three times a day. Oh, my God. On top of the sushi. That's and Chad Nichols tuna recipe. Yeah. <laughs> 12 ounces cooked tuna. <laughs> and, you know, I, I always did good with big amounts of fish. It didn't upset my stomach. And and that's what I was doing. And all last year, I just would never thought it was the fish. And I just got worse and worse and worse. I bet you more people have this, Dom, that don't know about it. So it's funny you say that is once I started posting this on Instagram, people were messaging me thinking like, I have this, this and that symptom. I think it's this. I've been eating a lot of fish. There's actually one guy in particular who I've been talking to. He lives in Canada and he's probably going to watch this. And he swears he had it. He had all the symptoms. I said, go get a blood test. Mm -hmm. And he had a high, he had a very high uh, recent exposure scoring mm -hmm. on the blood test. Um, and now I told him, come off all the gear, stop training for a little bit take these supplements and he's like getting better. And we're comparing notes in the blood work and everything too, because he didn't have pumps. Um, you also get circulation issues because mm. um, mercury takes up 90% of every red blood cell in your body. Um, mm. Along from that, it also takes up the bonding sites where iron is in your body. Oh, so a lot of people get certain forms of anemia and this guy, um, his hematocrit and red blood cells and everything were very low. And when I was on cycle, even when I was on a very big cycle over the last year, my red blood cells were like, and hematocrit were on the lower end of normal. You know, they should have been through the roof. And so, what, was your red blood cell distribution width weird also? Do you ever test that? 
I don't. Did we test okay. RDW? Well, I don't. RDW. Yeah. yeah, RDW. Exactly. Yeah. I have to go. Everything yeah. was in range, but lower end of normal. Interesting. Okay. Um, but nobody thought anything of this, including myself, until um, in July. I was still putting a piece of the puzzle together. I'm like, why do I have circulation issues? Why do I have pump issues? This and that. Talking to people online, and uh, it's because of that. Like, it doesn't matter how much gear you take with this, it doesn't work. Like, it was the craziest thing. I usually respond very easy to gear. And I've never seen, I wasn't getting stronger. I wasn't growing. I was feeling worse. It was the craziest thing I've ever seen. That's fascinating. Well, you know, what's interesting about this, by the way, just, I just thought, you know, maybe this is like, I told you so kind of thing, but when I was young, I was always thinking like fish has mercury in it. And they say, if, my father always used to tell me fish is very healthy. It's good for your brain, eat fish. And I didn't know why it was healthy, but I knew it had mercury. So when I was younger, I was like, I don't want to eat this kind of stuff. Like when I was 12 or 13, then later I read about fish oil. Thank God I found out when I read academic papers that fish oil by itself is not inferior to eating fish. So then I realized, like, it seems that fish, the mercury could just be bad for me. Then I did some more research. It turns out, like, even slightly higher mercury levels are associated with cardiovascular disease and neurotoxicity, which we'll talk about later. So yeah. I was like, I'm, I just don't eat fish. I never eat fish. And I just take fish oil. But uh, I'm, it's interesting. Like, a lot of people don't think it's a real concern. No, it is 100% a real concern. Because, what would you say, Boston? Well, I was asking Leo, is there any mercury in fish oil tabs? Yes. No, no, no. 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 With the ethyl ester version, they remove it. Now, there may be, there may ah, be, okay. Dom might be right. There may be some companies that have, like, really bad, uh, like, procedures or something. But I've never read any third-party review that found mercury in a fish oil uh, thing. Just because of the, the dis distillation they do moving into ethyl ester. Uh, usually they do that for that purpose to get rid of the mercury. You're correct. It's all about the process of how they extract it. But, but you're right. Also cod liver oil, which a lot of people drink is just filled with mercury. Yeah. And yeah. Funny, funny you say cod. Um, I, I only eat cod in all my preps from eight weeks out. It was cod every meal, except for my first meal. Like, why do you even like fish, bro? It, it's taste, it smells like weird. It smells really oh, weird. You got to so admit. I, 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 would you say Boston? In contest prep, it becomes your best friend, right? Oh, dude, it prep. I mean, especially when you make it right, it's you can eat again 10, 12 ounces in a sitting, mm. easy, and it's With not no like choking, no blow, none at all. Not like a choking down chicken or turkey. And Leo, I used to, I used to have a, a small family owned fish store in Bensonhurst, Brooklyn, Italian neighborhood, you know, Bensonhurst, and little old man used to own it. So I used to call there every week. And say, hey, you know, I'm coming by Friday. Uh, just make sure my, the, I get the fresh cod. You make sure I get the fresh, never frozen. Yeah. I would get that. It didn't have the fishy smell. I would soak it in lemon, soak it in lemon in the refrigerator, mm -hmm. season it, uh, bake it, and you never tasted any fish. Wait, are you from? Are you from near Bensonhurst? Yeah, yeah. Oh no way! This is like a really legendary place in, in Brooklyn. Yeah, that's actually, what my dad grew up there. Wow, that's where the whole mafia is from. Like that, yeah. Everybody's from Bensonhurst, like every other person that you see on the so Wikipedia it's, mafia. It's a, very, it's a very different place now. Now the Italian community is very small. It's mm. pretty diverse. But yeah, Bensonhurst, uh, that's the Italian, that's the biggest Italian neighborhood in Brooklyn. That's what I hear. Okay, wait, we should go through some. I took some notes that I wanted to cover here to make it informative for people before we talk about chelation. So I just want to talk about like, what does the mercury do to the brain? But I did some research. So when the, the main issue seems to be this. So inorganic mercury, which is certain versions of mercury, can't pass the blood-brain barrier. But organic mercury can. When it does pass the blood-brain barrier, it gets stuck there. It, uh, due to methylation, it turns into some reactive ions. And these mercury ions get stuck inside the cells of the brain. Not in the extracellular, inside cells, including neurons, which are the main cells of the brain, and the glia, which are your immune uh, center of your nervous system. So they get stuck in there. When they do, they do a couple of common themes. The first is these ions and the mercury somehow interact with glutathione and cysteine, thereby depleting glutathione potential in the brain, reducing the antioxidant potential. They also mess up with calcium homeostasis in the brain, causing little calcium ions to enter cells when they shouldn't, causing oxidative stress. Thereby, you need more glutathione, but you don't have it. So you have now a lot of oxidative stress in the brain. Um, it also causes the because of the oxidative stress causes mitochondrial toxicity, breaking the mitochondrial electron transport chains uh, efficacy. And finally, most interestingly, now this is not a uh, this is probably a result of what we were just talking about, but I thought this was relevant to you, Dom. One of the most consistent findings in mercury studies, uh, mercury poisoning studies of animals, is inhibited uh, GABA activity in the brain. 
So specifically, there's a enzyme called glutamic acid decarbo decarboxylase, which converts glutamate to GABA in the brain. It's your only source of GABA in the brain. It inhibits that enzyme and causes a reduction in GABA levels in the brain. That reduction in GABA levels will make, I mean, naturally, that's how people get suicidal ideation, anxiety, despair, depersonalization, also associated with GABA. So it's, it's the worst like a uh, neurotransmitter to have downregulated, you know, that's what causes epilepsy, tremors, you know, basically GABA is the calming neurotransmitter in the brain. So it removes this calming neurotransmitter that also inhibits activity. So you have a lot of excess activity and then you don't have your antioxidant. So you have oxidative stress everywhere. So over time you get deterioration in the brain. Now, the interesting thing though, is that the chelators, which you should move to next, don't actually pass the blood brain barrier, except one, the DM, I know you're taking DM, DMSA and DMPS, right? Yes. Now, just for the audience to know, there's a lot of metal chelators and there's a lot of studies on them. And so some chelators have a better affinity to bind to a certain metal. So some chelators are better at lead, some are better at mercury. The two best for lead are specifically DMSA, which is the best for removing organic mercury by itself and DMPS, which is more toxic, but more, probably more effective. And it's the standard antidote for inorganic mercury. Like if someone injected you with mercury, if you got mercury poisoning, you're taking both though. What's your protocol? Uh, so it, I actually switched my doctor in June. He just wanted me doing DMSA 500 milligrams, uh, every, uh, twice a week, um, for four weeks in June, in July, I switched my doctor because I spoke to Jason. I, he goes, go for the DMPS. He worked with one of the leading um, functional medicine doctors in the U.S. He's actually on the board for heavy metals. And DMPS is, uh, isn't recognized here in the U.S. So it has to be ordered um, yeah. uh, specialty. In Europe, it's the main chelator for mercury. Um, so now it's 100 milligrams of DMPS every other week. So I go for an IV. Yeah. Um, before they run the DMPS, they do two grams of glutathione. Oh, great. Yeah, to prevent more... Um, more oxidative because, stress and help it clear out because glutathione is also a chelator in a, in a minor way. So it helps it really draw out because two, if you're taking um, chelators or anything that would draw out heavy metals, if your detox pathways aren't open and functioning, it's going to cause a lot more issues yeah. than not using the chelators. It's, it's like if, if guys think about this, I always worried about this because I have so many tattoos. Thank God I don't have color tattoos. But if you have color tattoos, no, I do. I have some white because these piece of shit tattoo artists, when you're not looking, they put some white in there. But anyway, the white contains mercury and red. No, the white contains that. aluminum. The, the red contains mercury, I think. I but anyway, because the... a couple of my, I only have my forearms done. Ah. And I have on this one, I have like shading around. It's like sort of like clouds. Yeah. And when I got it done, there was like white little lightning bolts put in between the clouds. Without your, they didn't tell you it was going to be white? I knew it was going to be white, oh, but I didn't know there was mercury. This was yeah. 2018. Yeah, the white and the red. So the problem is this. If you go to, like a lot of people laser their tattoos. When you go to laser your tattoo, you just released whatever's stored in there, just like if you're chelating. And now you've got, oh, you've, you've lasered your hand before? Yeah. Uh, I had this done after my mom died. I did everything that she told me not to do after she died. I stopped bodybuilding. Oh, wow. I got a fucking hand tattoo in 2017. Long story short, I was going to try to join the army because my brothers went. And I'm like, you know what? Screw it. I'll stop bodybuilding before I go to the army. It'll be something on my bucket list. And they said, no, hand or neck. And I spent five months lasering this thing off. I went every other week, which you're not supposed to do. Yeah. I got really sick every time. Um, but not yeah. supposed to do because of that toxicity. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And the <laughs> lady, though, I told her I needed to go fast. She said, okay, come every other week. She's not supposed to do that. And every no. time I went, I told her, turn it up as high as you can. I don't care about the pain. And every time my blood pressure and my blood sugar would plummet at the start, the nurses would have to put ice packs, give me sugar, and then they'd have to keep going. But um, yeah, I had a but bro, that, that laser pain is nothing compared to like a stomach tattoo. They're always like, I, I, I laser one, one tattoo because it's just messed up. They designed it weirdly. And I got it from, from not a great tattoo artist. But whenever I go there, um they're always like oh do you need numbing thing they try to put this numbing cream on me i'm like this is nothing like you don't understand 16 hours of a belly tattoo you've never you've only tattooed your forearms yeah forearms and okay. i have the back of my neck so i never thought tattoos hurt until one day i did made the stupid mistake of hiring two tattoo artists that were traveling so that so I, I could only get them at the same time to tattoo my belly for 15 16 hours straight by the end of this thing, I was literally shaking physically. It was like the nerve, the nerve pain, something around your belly because your organs are there hurts more. Anyway, I was getting off track. What I was going to say is the chelators, you choose them according to their affinity of the heavy metal and their relative inaffinity for the other minerals in your body because they're also pulling out other minerals. 
So you try to find the, the but that's why I was saying DMSA and DMPS are the most specific to mercury. So I do uh, the 100 milligrams of DMPS twice a month, uh, you know, every other week. Yeah. I guess we can say on the weeks in between, it's 500 milligrams of DMSA three days in a row. So let's say Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, 500 milligrams, 500 milligrams, 500 milligrams. I didn't do it for this last month because the last time I took it a little over a month ago, it was really hurting my stomach. So I wanted to give my body a little break off of it and just do the DMPS. But this week I am actually running the DMSA again and then keep going with the plan because DMSA, it, uh, it really like messes with your stomach. DMSA does more, but it's, it's is it just your stomach? Cause it's less toxic. It seems than most. Yeah, of it. it's, it's just stomach. Uh, I get really bloated. I get really gassy, um, constipated for a day, which isn't good. So I took a break off of it. You know, they, both IV, they IV this stuff. Uh, the DMPS is IV. And but so the DMPS can be taken orally too. Well, yeah, it could be taken orally, but the best way to take the DMPS yeah, I've seen that. is um, intravenously, yeah. So I'm guessing this mercury poison, it's stored in your muscle tissue? Yeah, so basically it stores in your brain. Um, like he said, the organic mercury stores in your brain, uh, organs, muscle tissue, and connective tissue. So uh, my joints, my joints are starting to feel better, but they were killing me for the longest time. And yeah, muscle tissue, like it really stores in muscle tissue big time. Wow. So it, without these supplements that you're talking about, does it go away on its own or, or it just takes a long time or what? It will take an extremely long time for it to even come out. Wow. Uh, yeah. Half-life of inorganic mercury in the brain is five to 27 years. Wow. Half-life and the, and the estimates are closer to 27. There's just some aberrant post-mortem studies that were earlier, but it's really 27 and a half. It probably took him 15 years to get it to that bad level. Yeah, honestly, I think it was building up because like I said, all my life, every off season, I would eat sushi every week. It was just a thing. Me and my dad would go for sushi. Uh, dates were always sushi, you know, and I just it was easy for me to eat. It was clean and I could eat a lot of it. And then, uh, you know, I moved here and I'm eating it even more. And I just made it worse. I just never thought you would never think about what's so bad about fish. It's just raw fish and, and rice. And it, is it why you've uh, you've backed out of a couple preps because you just can't sustain? No, them? no, no. So um, 2000, so 2016, I did the New York Pro, bombed out of that. My mom was in the hospital, died, that whole thing. Um, I kind of lost my mind for a little bit. Um, drank a lot up until about 2016, 2017. So 2017, I was going to do the Frigno Classic. Um, that was July into August. I put 30 pounds on in like a month. And then Max's girlfriend told him my car and I was broke as shit and I couldn't afford anything. So I'm like, what am I doing here? Um, so I was getting my life together again. 2018, I had the back surgery. And then uh, two th August 3rd, 2019 was when I said, fuck this. I'm getting back into bodybuilding. And uh, yeah, I started training again, but consistently um, taking gear again, consistently eating. And then, you know, all this happened. Wow. I mean, I remember about a year ago, me and you were uh, messaging about you thought it was something to do with your in, yeah, of your digestion tract. You thought it was like a digestive issue. So that's what it's all started. Like people, um, for instance, Jason Hub, he had severe stomach issues for a year before they found out it was the mercury because it really affects the digestive system in a big, big way. I didn't know that. A couple of in other interesting notes. Did you know, Boston, that they do hemodialysis or hemofiltration sometimes when people get acute mercury poisoning? They'll do a combination of like IV DMPS and the dialysis at the same time. That's smart. That's smart. Because the kidneys can fail from the toxicity. Yeah. It's funny. I mean, well, not funny, but I was actually, somebody told me about that. And I was like looking online if I was able to do that. Dialysis? <laughs> They're probably it out quick. Out faster. To get it out. Yeah, I want to do You know what? I wanted it out quick. I was like, if that takes it out, then that takes it out. But I don't think it pulls from, um, but like Leo just said, it's acute. I don't think it would pull from muscle tissue and organs no. and stuff like that. Honestly, my biggest worry about all this, um, you know, I'm, I'm starting the last few weeks, which I'll get into is, has been really good. Um, it's the mental part of it. I'm not depressed anymore. I don't have those thoughts anymore. My focus is coming back, but my memory is really, really bad. Well, there's, there's, um, about, about that brother, by the way, there's sometimes like acute effects on memory that dissipate with time. So, mm -hmm. so if you had like a lot of oxidative stress, you may have had like neurons in your, in the hippocampus where the memory center of the brain die, but that also happens, for example, with marijuana use, the hippocampal neurons die. That's how memory gets affected in general. You know, so, I better stop because at night I had still have trouble sleeping. Um, oh. you know, I'll wake up like anywhere between six, 10 times a night that I know of. 
And so I've been eating uh, edibles every night before I go to sleep because it knocks me out. But that's probably making my memory even worse. Yeah, probably just acutely. But just to mention on this, so if you if you use marijuana for a few years and have bad memory and stop, most people regain some of their short term memory in the next six months to a year. It starts to improve. So the brain has some kind of, you know, it can it can show itself as being poorly performing, but it can recover sometimes. It's not always that all the neurons, like a lot of neurons have died. You can't recover from this. You know what I mean? So what I'm trying to say is you might have a temporary lasting issues that may go away with time. I hope so, because I mean, uh, with my clients, like now I put everybody on WhatsApp, like everything. I don't do emails, all the conversations, questions, plans are all sent through there. So I can't forget anything, <laughs> but I feel bad for my girlfriend because like earlier in the day, sometimes I'll tell her something. And then later in the day, I'll tell her, she goes, Hey, you told me that earlier. I'd be like, Oh fuck. Or right. like, I'll, I'll simple things go to the store and I'm like, okay, what do we need? Well, I'll order Instacart or whatever. Oh, I need this, this and that. And I'll fucking forget something. I'm like, Oh shit. You know, was well, it affecting your coaching? Um, you know what? Yes, it was to be honest. Yes, it was. So that's why in May, June and July, I wasn't posting as much in my story to get new clients. I didn't really want too many new clients because I just wanted to heal first because I realized like, number one, I wasn't able to focus as well. Um, two, like putting thoughts together, like figuring things out, like, uh, you know, uh, a peak, for example, thank God I didn't have that many people competing earlier this year. But having to process things wasn't as easy for me. I really had to focus and focus was a big issue for me. And then the memory thing. So I was like, you know what, let me just slow down a little bit, you know, relax a little bit, take care of my clients, not take as many and get myself good. So, um, but the last few weeks, I've been doing so much better, thank God, because I was getting really worried for a while. By the way, it's not a bad idea. Remember I mentioned cerebral license to you before when we talked? So well, I was just going to ask you, when you were just talking about the neurons and the brain, yeah. So think about this, like if you're if you're currently chelating the mercury, I assume the mercury has to get out of the intracellular, the cells in the brain. Now, obviously, the chelate is not passing, but it's reducing a lot of the bloodstream mercury, which over time, this sometime the, the ions may pass. I don't know how it happens, but it gets rid of mercury in the brain. My assumption, though, is when it does so, it, there probably is acute toxicity there in the brain also, not just in the kidneys. If so. Cerebrolysin is the most neuroprotective compound on earth. Like it's very, it's like taking growth hormone, but for your brain and the feeling is very similar. Also, cerebrolysin across all studies lowers inflammatory markers in the brain. Also, another thing that you may want to look into that particularly lowers inflammation in the brain is naltrexone. It's called low dose naltrexone therapy. Maybe a couple of things you could consider in the, in the just the next. And the other thing about cerebral license is you may notice a rejuvenative effect in the brain. It may uh -huh. reduce inflammation so much that you may notice a benefit in, in a couple of weeks, I think. Well, I Happen still have a lot speak. of that from the protocol you, uh, you told me. So I'm going to like start that tonight because that's like my training is going good now. Well, as good as it can go. My pumps are slowly coming back. I'm able to train without losing weight, staying a little bit fuller. I'm getting stronger. Um, now it's just like getting the, I know it's going to take time to heal. My body's healing. That's yeah. why I don't want to jump on any crazy cycles or anything either. Um, but it's mainly just getting my brain function back to where I can fully just, you know, be like my old self would be like, just things just come to me like that. You know, it takes, it takes some time. I've had the depersonalization before and I've had some of those like, you know, deep uh, problems and it takes time. If you're in the right path, your brain, brain recovers. We have, like uh, agile brains, you know, and they, even when they appear to be not working, there's always something called cognitive reserve, um, which shows up in a lot of academic papers. Like you'll see a lot of brains that 70% of them should not be functioning, but the person appears normal. Mm -hmm. And that we call that cognitive reserve because of plasticity, your brain can reorganize itself, you know? And Leo, what's the worst thing that can happen with somebody with mercury poisoning if they don't catch it? Death. Death. It's really? acute, it die, acutely it fatal. Die. Yeah. See, that's the problem. Most people probably like Dom think, oh, fish is bad. If I eat a lot of it, I'm going to die That from mercury poisoning. It's not, they don't think like there's levels to this, you know, right, Dom? Wow. I did yeah. not know anyone dying from it. Yeah. yeah no, you can die. Acutely. Well, yeah. people, well, he, like he said, sometimes like if you read online, there's case studies. Um, some people will inject themselves with mercury to try to commit suicide. Um, but also, too, yeah, there's actually studies you'll read where they use DMPS on uh, ER uh, patients. Like I've this. seen those, but I didn't know it was suicides. They had inj they were injections. Oh, interesting. <laughs> oh, yeah. Wow. Um, but also, too, like you like you just mentioned, um, a big part of mercury is also stored in the kidneys. So, of course, the scarring of the kidneys and breaks them down um, also in the heart as well. So, you know, 
you may have a cardiovascular disaster, we'll call it, or whatever, or kidneys. And doctors may say it's kidneys or heart, not realizing or not even thinking. Because it, it won't show up on blood work, right? Nope, unless you test for it. And even then, it's going to show it. exposure, not the body burden, but stored inside your muscles and organs. Wow. Exactly. Oh, I wanted to mention another thing, though, Dom. I don't know if you, you probably heard of this, but did you know that the natural detoxification process for the inorganic mercury in the brain is actually the mercury somehow combines with selenium, another oh, yes. mass? You heard about that? Yeah, so that's a very, very big thing as well, is that there are supplements that can, I have a whole stack I put together. Um, there are supplements that can help take away the body burn and, and the damage that mercury does to the body. So like you just said, like you said earlier, it dramatically reduces glutathione in the body, um, but also with selenium. So a lot of people with mercury toxicity, mercury poisoning, um, get very low in selenium. Mm -hmm. So, you know, months ago, I started taking 400, uh, I believe it's micrograms a day, of uh, selenium, now I'm down to 200. Um, you know, let me, okay. you want me to talk about the stack I'm on? Yeah, sure. That would be very interesting. Yeah, just to mention to the audience, so the um, I think the, the recommendations from governing bodies are 100 micrograms of selenium a day as an intake for men, and the max is usually 200 to 300. I assume that if you had mercury poisoning, you'd probably want to risk having a little slightly higher selenium. The reason why selenium, just for those that don't know, is associated with insulin resistance and diabetes. So that's why I don't supplement with it. But I think maybe people who eat fish should just because. Yeah. So that's a big question I see online is um, if you're eating fish, should you take, should you maybe take selenium with the meal mm -hmm. or cilantro, which is a natural chelator or stuff like that? Yeah, or they're also those natural chelators. Or chlorella, which is a binder. Um, so, you, you know, if it gets released in the bloodstream and into your gut, at least it'll bind to it and go into your, your shit, your poop and out, which is a main pathway for the mercury to leave your body. Interesting. Um, so basically after all my research, I seen that not only aside from the chelators taking out the good minerals, mercury does really mess with your electrolytes and minerals big time. That's why I had a hard time staying hydrated. Um, so also with the glutathione, I wanted to take in more sulfur compounds to raise glutathione in my body. Mm -hmm. So aside from the weekly IVs I get of glutathione, um, I take 2,800 milligrams a day of NAC. I take six grams of glycine. Yeah. Um, that's for the sulfuric. These are good. These are good doses. Those are what people should be using, not a gram of NAC. And glycine also has, you know, another benefit. It will slow down your nervous. I don't know if you ever noticed an antidepressant effect from glycine, not an, an anxiety, like reducing anxiety or calm. That's yeah? why um, I'll take my first dose when I wake up and my last dose before bed, okay. um, because it does have a relaxing effect. And it also, it's really good for gut health as well. You know, uh, you know what that's from the glycine, because there's actually receptors for glycine in the nervous system. They act mm -hmm. similar to GABA. Glycine is inhibitory in the nervous system, so it can calm. So if, if those of you have anxiety or have a hard night sleeping, if you try three grams of taurine and uh, sorry, two grams of taurine and three grams of glycine, taurine also binds to the same glycine receptors and it's an antioxidant. So the two together sometimes will put somebody to sleep safely. So I take uh, just real quick, new men, multimineral morning and night. I take 10 grams of vitamin C a day, uh, split up throughout the day, because again, vitamin C is one of the biggest uh, fighters for mercury burden. I take Good 800 dosage. grams of vitamin E a day. Um, now I'm down to 200 MCGs of selenium a day. Uh, 5,000 I use of vitamin D3, four grams of Wiley's fish oil a day. I'm on six. You should raise the fish oil. You should raise the EP for sure. Because you're in a very inflammatory environment, EPA is the most effective single supplement at reducing inflammatory markers. But you need like a higher dose. I've noticed a major difference, bro, between using four grams and eight grams. Major difference. Well, it's fine. I mean, uh, I didn't really look into the inflammatory effects of it, but even with uh, fixing lipid panels, there was a big difference between four and eight to 10 grams. Really? Yeah. So yeah. the inflammatory effect is the most, other than the anti-platelet aggregation, like the clotting, those are the two most pronounced effects, it, EPA the, specifically. That's the most of what I need of because it's very inflammatory. Um, garlic pills, I take the life extension, eight pills a day. Split oh, wow. That's the best garlic. Yeah. Yeah, that's, um, that's intense. Do you, do you, does it hurt you when you take it? Some, do you ever burp or something? And you're like, whoa, that was some potent garlic. There's no uh, more potent garlic than life extensions. One. It's funny because uh, my girlfriend thought I was a weirdo. I took it one day, I burped up. I'm like, oh, it kind of tastes good. It feels like I just ate pizza. <laughs> <laughs> She's like, what the fuck? Bro, I tried uh, to give it to my wife. Like she, she took it twice. The third time, look, I was giving her like a handful of pills. 
she pulled out this one one she's like what is this why am i taking this i was like that's the garlic she's i'm not I'm not taking this one <laughs> no, dude that's in one of my blood pressure supplements and when you when you when you put it in your mouth to swallow it that shit you smell it right away you yeah, tasted it, this thing it, remi it reminds me of pizza i don't know why i'm a weirdo you're lucky you have the italian background it reminds me of nothing except just a pungent taste and then uh, AD Liver Plus, I take AD Tutka as well. Uh, magnesium citrate, I take 1,000 milligrams before bed. Uh, I was taking 100 milligrams of zinc picone because uh, mercury reduces zinc dramatically. Mm. Um, so now I'm down to 30 milligrams a day. I take five grams of astragalus a day um, you know, for my kidneys because it is a bit harsh in the kidneys a kid later. Mm. And then uh, two scoops of fiber before bed. And then, you know, my other health subs. Like how, much, how much Tudka? Uh, yeah, just a gram a day right now. How much? Uh, one gram a day. Oh shit! So that's a lot. Okay. Well, yeah. so for the for the audience to know, tatka and adka, U D C A, which you can get from anabolic pharmacists, by the way, the real medicine version. Both of those are act similarly in studies, and the standard dose in the U.S. for the only FDA approved treatment for liver cirrhosis, which is adka, is five hundred milligrams twice a day. So you're using the exact dose, and they're very comparable. So you're using the standard dose. Boston lower than. 500 milligrams once a day is not a no i see some I, I use the one from project ad like the one that uh, dom uses is a really good one they're they're 250 migs per cap i think the the one from um there's one that they sell on amazon that gets me a little sh uh, weird it's on the cheaper end and for two capsules it says it's 1.5 grams i just don't know if some of these supplements are like because they're not fda you know i wonder if it's even real some of them oh so that's that was a, a big problem with tucka when it became popular years ago is first off, it's very expensive to make and it's not easy um, for companies to really get. So like, for instance, everybody's big with the NutraCost uh, Tudka from Amazon. It's trash. Somebody tested it and I forgot where the, the testing was, but it was garbage. Um, so there is a very big, you know, gap between good and, 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 and shit Tudka. Mm -hmm. um, so there are a few good brands. 80 Tudka, that one's tested. Leviathan Tudka, that one's great. Um, and that's the only really other ones I, I, I know have been tested not only with blood work, but people, you know, test the batches of it. Are you using the AD fiber? Yeah. I take two scoops of that before bed. Okay. I, I need to try that. I, I have it. I haven't, I haven't opened it up yet. I want to try that one. You'll like it because, um, it's not like a gel, like most, uh, like most fibers, it tastes great. And it actually, it works really good too. Yeah. Interesting. So I just want to mention real quickly, I, I, there was one supplement you were taking, which I wanted to comment on, but I forgot what it was, but the vitamin E, if you're getting a broad range vitamin E while you're in a highly oxidative straight like, uh, state like you are, um, you know, for example, vitamin E has been shown to increase lung cancer incidence when supplemented in smokers. So people with high oxidative states, uh, states, it's vitamin E and A that sometimes worsen their condition of health. Now, I looked into why this happens with vitamin E, for example, it happens quite prominently in the cardiovascular system, and it seems to happen uh, in oxidative, oxidative states. And it, it seems to happen when you have the full spectrum of vitamin E. You may have less risk with like gamma tocopherols, like Carlson has a great uh, product called E-Gems, but I wouldn't take the full vitamin E just now while you're going through that. I'm taking, um, it's not the, the broad spectrum, whatever uh, you want to call it. It's oh. from, uh, oh geez, my friggin' brain. Um, designs for health. Okay, interesting. Very, yeah, very good product. brand. It's just uh, usually like medical offices sell it, or yeah, it's a great product. Doctor, yeah, it's not really sold in most stores, but yeah, that's what I'm taking. That's the gamma, uh, the gamma version of it. Perfect, perfect. Okay, so well, well, before we end with this, we didn't even mention that. So just for you guys to know, there's cadmium, arsenic, uh, lead, and mercury. Those there's four major heavy metals that you can get through food, and that can really you know, did you test your other levels? Were they all fine? So yeah. So I mean, not only through food, don't forget the environmental toxins as well. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Um, you know, mercury, a big thing with what I learned with mercury in this country is when we get when factories use coal from China, it's high in mercury. And when they let, you know, when the smoke comes out, it takes a downdraft and goes state to state. And that's another way people can get raised levels of mercury. Oh, uh, but man. when I did the pretest, my aluminum was slightly elevated. Lead was slightly elevated, mercury was off the charts. When we took the chelator for the challenge test, my aluminum was pretty high, but it wasn't over the toxicity limit, which, you know, you don't really want it high at all. My lead, so the high point for lead was 1.1. 1. Uh, 1. Mine was 1.1. 1. 1. Wow. So I had lead stored in my bones, apparently, from 
could have been working on construction sites most of my life or, you know, could have been anything. And then the mercury is off the chart, but everything else is normal. Yeah, you've been exposed to a lot of like blue collar work. So, but the thing is, I just want to mention to the audience, uh, there's a lot of cases of people having high lead levels due to supplements. Supplements frequently contain high head level, lead levels. Whenever I look at a third party review of supplements, depending on the supplement, sometimes a third of the products have uh, high le lead levels and they're unacceptable. So, so if you, it's funny you mentioned that too. Sorry to interrupt you because I got to see because it comes to mind what I totally forget Me too, yeah. is um, now I would actually like to start sending samples of gear out to somewhere to be tested because again, exactly. these powders that these UGLs get are from China and who the hell knows what the hell could be in it. It could be, you know, lead it could be anything you know i know i know I, I that's i've been thinking about that for a long time actually that this chinese stuff has some heavy metals in it we all know it and this is nothing you can do about it. i mean you're going to test it but you're going to find another there's not that many you know i i use a awesome. product every every day that's supposed because i'm actually worried about gear com combining like having like metals and stuff you probably heard of it dom i completely forgot the name of it it, it, it has amazing reviews and it's a green green thing and it's like a powder chlorella and, Huh? It's it's probably is it chlorella? <laughs> Boss, yes, it chlorella. Work. Yes. <laughs> yeah, so actually, I've, that is very. I've been that shit every day. That's very very good. Very so good for you, generally. That, yeah. That's uh that's gonna be a binder. So if it's in your bloodstream, it'll bind and go into your shit, and you'll poop it out. Um, another good, it's actually a key later is NAC. Everybody should be taking NAC. Not only is it a master antioxidant, but it has a very, it's not as, you know, strong as a medic medication uh, chelator, but it does have a very good effect of chelating. So if you're going to combine um, chlorella and NAC, that's a really good combo for heavy metals. I, I IV my NAC, but the chlorella, I just, it, it, dude, it's like a light, <laughs> powder, it's like a light powder. Um, you're not used to these kind of our show is really intense yeah oh, i i i watch i watch all you guys shows oh no uh, but still every time i hear it, it's something new that he <laughs> I mean, listen i i i be about i i be about four to five things a day now right now and like it's everything's working like i i'm IVing glucosamine that shit's really helpful my joints i i'm IVing um what? nac uh I, I mean yeah I'm IVing everything. You could. I, I have the. I have the crack marks on my fucking. Oh jeez, <laughs> bro. Wait, glucosamine has like like very little evidence for it in the academic literature. Do you actually notice a difference? It I took it for head. years. It could be in my head, man. But my shoulders feel like brand new. I bet you feel better because of the other things. Are are you IVing vitamin C? It, the vitamin C is with the glucosamine. It's it's a co combination. That's a crazy combination. To oh, it. That's yeah. a random. I do those. I try to do those once a month as well. I get a uh, twenty five thousand milligrams. IV vitamin C. Yeah, vitamin C is. I I would. I mean, if I had to IV, I would IV NAC and vitamin C like three days a week. I, I would really glutathione do glutathione daily. Yeah, I mean everything. Yeah, the glutathione is really good too. It's, I actually feel like it has a big effect in the kidneys because, um, I mean, ever since I moved to Vegas, I've been doing. I get IVs all the time, and I always include glutathione. And if I don't do that, I inject it intramuscularly, mm -hmm. and even when I was on a heavy cycle, training hard, my EGFR never dipped below eighty five. Creatinine never went over 1.1. 1 .1. Um, so I feel like, you know, flushing the kidneys out with the, um, you know, the saline bags, it could be, I try to do anything between a quarter of a gallon to half a gallon when I do it, plus the glutathione. I feel like it really just, it's been helping my kidneys because in June, when they did my blood work, when I didn't train for two weeks, my EGFR was 114 or 115 and my creatinine was like 0.8. Yeah. That's great. Oh. Yeah, I wish I lived in. I, I do. Are your IV clinics cheaper than in LA and Vegas? Everyone in oh, Vegas seems to do IV clinics. Expensive as shit. I'm sure they're definitely cheaper here than LA or New York. Because I mean, everybody I know who goes to Vegas when they party or whatever, they do an IV thing and then come back to LA the same day. You can call them right to your uh, your hotel. No way. This is very. Yeah. I mean, I go to a clinic. I had them come to my house once, but I go to a clinic once a week or twice a week. Okay, let's up the ante a little bit. I had a, a subscriber send me a post on Instagram. Or he tagged me in a story of his in which he was showing he he put in I, the it's called a catheter i guess put in a catheter in his vein in his vein so that he can do iv injections daily and not do what boston's doing so he has literally this huge attachment and it, the picture was him in the gym with this huge attachment so that's what they do to uh when my mom was going through treatment they usually put up they call it a port yeah. and they put one right here and i believe it goes into uh whatever vein in your neck and so they can easily just put your medications in through the day. I remember my sister used to do it for her. 
give her medications I, right now. I mean, I've thought of it because the thing is you don't want to IV stuff because you don't want to slowly damage your blood vessels. I mean, if you look at any heroin addict, they have like their arms don't have veins. So well, Boston, you, you're going to get there. I, rot- I rotate with four different veins, but yes. And I reuse the same needle over and over and over. <laughs> no, bro. What are you doing? Every time. But hey, I'm, I'm, I'm doing everything. I'm already a kidney failure. What is it going to do to me? No, <laughs> why would you damage your vein, bro? You got a beautiful life ahead of you. No, no, no. Don't use. Listen, don't use a reused needle on a vein. Because because even I, I reuse insulin needles sometimes, but you know it's a little bent the second time. You know the fourth time it's a little. You'll feel the difference. I don't know, man. Now, there's no way I'm wasting insulin syringes. <laughs> <laughs> what? <laughs> what? What the hell? You have a sponsorship for needles. What are you yeah, talking I get, about? I get three needles and I still don't reuse. What is going on? Don't do this... it. Don't do it. Your veins, please. Do if you want to do a muscle, sure. Like I'll use, I'll reuse insulin needles on if it's an intramuscular. They actually, Leo. They actually don't look bad at all. I'm pretty, pretty good with it. That's that's ins- so. You have like a weird OCD thing about certain things. And one of them is apparently not not like wasting gear or you re, or never throwing away a good needle. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> wow, that's funny. Anyway, so that's the, okay. Let's move on. So I wanted to ask. Uh, wait, before we do, Dom, I wanted to ask you something. You went to the to the U.S. to the North Americans, which we just talked about. What did you think about it? I wanted to know what you. Oh, I didn't get to see the bodybuilding. I got there the day after. My girlfriend had um she had clients competing in bikini, so I didn't get to watch the. Uh, competitors in person. I was at USA's and I seen the bodybuilding there, um, but I didn't see the North Americans. Just what did you think of USA's? Uh, oh God, I mean, so here's the thing too. Pictures, were all, I've been to quite a few shows over the last few months. We've been traveling a lot, which is cool. You take my mind off things. Pictures no longer do any justice for people on stage. Really? Tampa Pro in person was pretty fucking cool. It even, you know, I have to say it was pretty impressive. But then you look at the pictures and you're like, whatever. USA, same thing. However, um, you know, it wasn't a normal USA's. Like, I mean, dude, that super heavyweight class was shit. Dude, it was you people. We used to love seeing the super heavies come out. People used to wait till the end of the show to watch super heavies. Hmm. It was not the normal super heavies we're used to whatsoever, especially USA's. I mean, even yeah, like you were heavyweight, right? Yeah, yeah. I was 224, 225 when I weighed in. Yeah. But, um, but yeah, do you think it's because. Not- do you think it's because the other divisions, this Boston's theory that the classic physique is pulling away talent from bodybuilding? Yeah. So number one, I believe, I mean, team bodybuilding's dead. So you have no up and coming guys anymore. Mm-hmm. Um, you have, you know, kids and even adults going into physique or classic physique, which they don't even belong there, most of them. Mm-hmm. And then I have a very, it's going to sound weird. Um, it's two points. The first point is that gear quality is nothing like what it used to be. Um, you know, I don't care. You may get a really good UGL and they may test really good, but again, it doesn't just cause they test really good. It doesn't mean that the powders were made as something that was strong years ago. Um, so one is gear quality cause gear quality across the board is shit. People are getting crap. People are also using fake antiestrogens if they use any at all. Wow. And then too, I mean, people don't train as hard. They just don't, they don't diet as hard. They don't train as hard. So you combine this all together. It's like one big disaster. Interesting. Um, oh, actually, about the people that don't belong in classic physique. So I, I've mentioned this often now, I think, but I to, Nick Strength and Power keeps making videos about him, and I watch Nick Strength and Power's videos, so I got it. I, so I keep hearing about this guy. I, today he made another video about Logan Franklin, and I'm looking at this thing, and I, he's in a good. He's posing so carefully, and I'm like, you're not a class, You don't have a small waist. You don't have broad shoulders. I don't understand. Some of the guys there are just little bodybuilders that are taller. They can't go to two twelve. But it's not like, why are we, I don't know how we build up this kind of impression. Like Chris Bumstead, wow, he's incredible. You know, uh, um, I guess it's proportions is what it is, like waist to shoulder and all that. And then the Lord Jones guy, and then the guy from uh, Florida, Boston, I forgot what his name is, who won the Classic Physique, beat Logan. They all do. But Logan Franklin doesn't have any kind of interesting uh, proportions. And then honestly, if you look at Breon Ainsley and... The other Terrence, who both I have great respect for also, but I, but when you look at them, they're like smaller bodybuilders. They have great proportions, but it's not like insane. You don't say like, it's not the same as Chris Bumstead, the width, you know? I mean, they, you know maybe they I are have, a bit closer. I have, I have to say, I'm a, I'm a very big... No, they're more aesthetic though, that's true. Actually. Oh yeah, big yeah, time. Like true. when I look at Terrence, um, you know, obviously nobody... Today Terrence's is waist doesn't body. exist at all. That's the thing. Tiny <laughs> waist, his muscles are very round. His posing is excellent. 
Um, his lines remind me of a classic bodybuilder. I was saying years ago, he should have, he should have been pl- placing way higher. Um, Terrence to me is a great classic bodybuilder. But how can he compete with Chris Bumstead and Lord small. Jones? He's too small. He's too small. That's what I'm saying. Like, I, I, I'm... Yeah, unless Chris would have to be way out of shape. Yeah. yeah. Well, that's very interesting because apparently Terrence is out of shape and he was the second uh, placer last year. So yeah. I have a feeling there's just I, I don't know much about classic physique, but I have a feeling that this Lord Jones guy or the guy who beat Logan will slip in there. I seen that Lord Jones guy today for the first time. I never seen him before. Somebody sent me this page and I was like, holy shit. Oh, yeah. He's it's crazy. He's in he's in classic physique. He's huge. He's bigger than everybody. Yeah, and he has proportions. I actually told told this person, I was like, damn, I'd love to put that guy in a real cycle and put him into the open. Yeah, I bet he doesn't even. Yeah, I bet he oh, barely uses anything. <laughs> exactly. So, wait, anyway, we Boston and I last episode gave our top five predictions for the Arnold in order. So let me um, let me you look give us a competitor list because I'm not up to date on the oh, list. Oh yeah, this is gonna be juicy. Yeah, do you, guys where, do you guys know where I can find the list quick? Uh, Boston would probably know. I don't have no idea. I, I actually I don't know. Maybe that bodybuilders were borders, but. I mean, I can, give, it. I can give you the names of most of them off yeah, my head. Yeah, Cedric's not in it. It's Bonac, Roly, um, Kuklo, Kuklo Ian, Ian, um, Akeem. Wait, I should probably find the list. I just got the, the list right now. So I have to say, it's going to be tough to call the order. Yeah. I'm, All right, wait, hold on, hold on. Before you answer, do you have Nick Walker in the top three? In the top three, no, but I top do have him. In the, I oh, uh, you know what? Yeah, it's difficult to put him in the top. It's it's really comp- competitive. The top five, right? We have we have a team. We have Sergio. Uh, Boston, where did I where did I place Nick? I don't remember. I don't did know. Do we place Nick in the top six? I, I don't, don't have him in the top five. No, I don't have him in the top three. He will. He may crack top five because. He comes in pretty hard. I mean, I have to say, I mean, personally, I don't like him because of what happened in the past. But I do have to say he did prove me wrong with some of my past statements. Um, you know, but I definitely don't have him in the top three. In the top three, I'm going to have to say um, Justin Rodriguez, if he comes in peeled. What? No, he has to be peeled. That's the thing. Well, here's uh, when I say this is my top three. This is if these guys come in 100%. Which, yeah, we have to we have to judge it that way, yeah. If that even happens. Um, Justin, if he comes in truly peeled with the new size he has, he'll be in the mix in the top three because I love his shape. But Wait, we have, we have can he to- beat Kuklo or Ian if they're in – because Ian just beat Justin. No, and- he's not, he's not going to beat Kuklo peeled, and he's not going to be Ian peeled. Yeah, so if we're talking peeled, he's not in the top three. Yeah, so that's the thing. Um it's tough because, like I said, it, people either come on or they come like totally off. I think I think he could beat Ian if he's peeled. I do. I think he can. I just don't think they will because Ian's like a favorite now. Like but he's what on. If, but what if Ian is truly peeled? But that's the thing. Like I, Ian leading up. I have to say, seeing Ian in person at the Tampa was yeah, a totally him. different animal than in pictures. His legs look way bigger in person. He looks oh. way harder in person. Um, oh. It's so odd because you see him in the pictures. And his legs look very narrow. Yeah. Wait, but in person he was pretty freaky. So you saw Phil Clahar too? I, okay, I, you I, can I, tell I, us then what was what was it like? Because we we didn't know. So my so pre judging Phil won it. Oh. I was a couple front couple rows away from the front row. That guy Phil he got better and better in the pre judging. His lines were amazing. Uh, his posing was great. He was very intense. His conditioning was excellent. And Ian was a tad off in the prejudging in person. But so I had him in second, to be honest. In the finals, Ian won because uh, uh, Phil came in a touch flat and he did fade, but Ian did come in harder. But this is the thing, like uh, Ian comes in, in person, he was a way different animal. Like I said, he looked great as opposed to pictures. But I would love to see him at 100% peaked. He hasn't come in 100% he on He hasn't the been 100%, no, he has not. Oh, but the Olympia, he was 100%, I think. Mm, yeah, he was he was close, but I wouldn't say it was 100. percent Really interesting. Yeah, but like I said, in person he really impressed me. Like in pictures, his legs look narrow. He doesn't look as hard, but in person he looked really good. What do you uh, think about his coach? He's a great guy. He gets guys blown up in the off season. They look good leading to the shows, but he seems to be inconsistent with nailing guys. Come show day. 
Yeah, I don't know if it's a diuretic thing or a diet thing or he what. He does the sodium loading and shit. I, I think it's all that crazy sodium manipulation. I think if he kept it, because his guys going at the show look great. They look freaky. And then, you know, show day, they just, they're either too flat or they're, or they're spilled. Yeah. You know, I think <laughs> if he kept things consistent, they would look good. I had no idea that he didn't uh, always deliver condition on this. What I did notice, though, honestly, to his credit, James Hollingshead seems to have eaten another person. He was way smaller a year ago before he started working with this guy. This is the thing, Ian. Like, he blows people up. He gets them super round. Mm. Um, you know, they do get, they even as round as they get, they're still able to stay detailed. Yeah. But it's like going into the show and the last few days, a lot of it goes away. Interesting. Very interesting. I, yeah. I don't know what he does the last week. not consistent at all. I mean, I've said this many times. He's like, I've never seen a, a guy at that caliber be that bad at peaking. That's interesting. How did he start that, getting popular? Know. What'd you say, Leo? How, how did he start getting popular? Who was his first like uh, famous a- athlete? Uh, athlete? Nicholas Vullard. Mm. Oh, interesting. Okay, so it's recent. So, so who's your top five? All right. So, so, so have... you have to have. Is Hadi competing? Do we know if he's competing or not? He just. I don't know if he's competing, but I know Hadi just posted that he got into the U.S. yesterday. Yeah, both him and Rami came from Dubai, my home city, which yeah. is uh, the man. If they're here, like they're here early. This is gonna be a fun Olympia. Well, that's that was the thing. Hadi barely made it, and oh. you know, I think he's going to give people a run for their money at the Olympia. I hope he gets second. I think he can get second. But my top five, if everybody's on a hundred percent, which isn't you know rarely ever the case, um, in no particular order, because I'm not even going to put that pressure on my brain right now. <laughs> I'm going to say Akeem, okay, Akeem, Sergio. Because I just seen recent pictures of him and he looks fucking ridiculous. Um, That's Steve, another Logan Franklin to me. Sergio is like Logan Franklin to me. I get confused. But Steve Kuklo and for the he fifth Bonac. Bonac, bro. So that's that's the thing though. What Bonac is his legs have been getting smaller every show. No, he comes in the top five. I, I mean, I'm going to have to have him maybe in fifth. Well, that's the thing. I'll have him in the top five thrown in the mix. I'm not going to say who's going to place first, second, or third, fourth, because who the hell but knows. But he won the last Arnold. Arnold. That's the thing, though. Dude, last Olympia, his legs were down. He wasn't as hard as he normally is. Um, it's, it's hard for me to say for sure because he's been a little bit off every time. So if, if Walker's not in the top five, he's going to be pissed. So I I've have I have six bets going so far right now that <laughs> – that he won't be top five at the Olympia. Uh, I don't see him top five at the Olympia at all, especially with who's going to the Olympia. I'm making a lot of money that day. <laughs> has, has there ever been a bodybuilder who actually said he would win the Olympia like Nick did? Or is he the Never. first? There's no way there's He's the first, the right? There's nobody who's ever done that publicly. <laughs> That's so I mean, listen, I, I love the... That's the good. That's good. Confidence Probably. in himself. Like I said, do I like him on a personal level based on my experience with him? No. Am I happy to see him doing well because he puts everything into this? Yes, I do. It, I can't knock him and say he doesn't work hard because he does work very, very hard. Um, but is he going to win the Olympia this year? No. <laughs> like, mm-hmm. come on. Like, like, I actually like, don't think he can ever win the Olympia unless it's a very – but then there are people that win the Olympia that like, like, just let's be honest, Flex winning the, I mean, a Flexitron, a Sean Roden winning the Olympia. And then um, I can't even remember the other guys. I always forget his name, but the guy who won last year, both of these guys were not like Ronnie Coleman or Dorian Yates. So if a year like that comes by, maybe I think he can win, but I don't think he can consistently win. That's the thing. It may be a year, but it's not going to be like back to back because, you know, I think he's... Structure wise. I think Just, he's 20 structure exactly 28 yeah, look at all the size he's added on yeah how much more size can you add on without blowing out your stomach and losing detail because you can only push the muscle out so much on a frame without losing detail yeah and he's not tall he's only like five six that's the thing is his frame can only hold so much wait and- he's five six Yes, at the most. Yeah, but people cool. keep saying he's gonna outsize like uh Bonac and other guys and stuff like he's the same no. size he's wow. in, in on his own, he looks like a freak. He looks great on his own. Put him next to other people. Like, for instance, Justin Rodriguez was off at the New York Pro. New York Pro mm. And they were neck and neck. Imagine if Justin was on. That's true. He put was them together. On. It's not like Nick is dwarfing people. On his own. No, he's, he's not. 
He has freaky body parts. That's the thing, yeah, but he's not dwarfing people. People act like he dwarfs everybody, especially in terms of width, but you can't be that wide if you're five six. It's just go not possible. Go, go, go five, six, six, two forty five on stage. Yeah, I, I'm gonna pay attention now. This was very informative for me, actually. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. So, uh, also, hey, Dom, another current event. So, I don't know if you saw the Shelby Starnes uh, podcast we we talked about, but I, I was curious. What What's your take, first of all, on, on the commotion that people make about diuretics right now? Do you think it's going to uh, help people or make any difference? Second, when I ask you, what is the craziest protocol you've ever heard? Okay, so I have a few different standpoints <laughs> in the whole Shelby thing. Um, I'll first, I'll go with the craziest protocol I've ever heard. And that is probably the craziest, craziest protocol I've ever heard between the aldactone starting a month out, um, starting diazide like three, four days out. I mean, it was astronomical amounts of diazide, um, plus Bumex, full doses of Bumex on top. That probably has to be the craziest protocol I've heard so Wait, far. Wait, that's what she said in the oh, interview. That's the one, yeah. Yeah. You've had the same, you, you've seen that protocol elsewhere? I'm talking about Shelby me. protocol. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. That's the craziest one. Yeah, of course. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I've heard some crazy protocols, but that's that's the craziest one I've heard between the yeah. doses of, of, of Bumex, diazide, plus of Dactone starting a month out. That's just crazy. Do, do people often use loop diuretics in the men's division? No, they don't. Like, uh, you know, to be you totally do, right. You well, do that. Well, when you work with Chad Nichols, you use Demodex, right? Yeah, we used them. Well, that's why I first heard of Demodex and used it was he used it with me and we used very low amounts of it. And I wasn't I wasn't on that tone. Um, but people don't really use, at least from what I've heard, people don't really use loop diuretics as much as what they used to, Leo. Mm. Um, but yeah, I mean, I've used it with a couple of clients. I don't want to name names because they're personal business, but I've used it with a few clients, you know, very in low amounts and pretty safely, not combining it with Aldactone and those other shit. Um, but people aren't really using it as much as they used to. Yeah. You know, you're a very honest guy, Dom. You really fit our show, actually. I was just reflecting on it. You're a very straightforward guy. Isn't he Boston? Do you, yeah, he, didn't he, he is, right? Didn't you have a podcast going with Trigizzle? Trigizzle? What, Trigizzle? Yeah, couple, That's couple, a new one. A couple years ago, we were doing it for like a year. Yeah, uh, he, he told me he got you all these clients and you ditched them or some shit, but I know that guy's so full of shit. Yeah, uh, on top of him uh, having somebody hack my website and offering offering people who left him who became my client sponsorships and telling people I was a drug addict and a drug dealer and I fucked oh. him over. Yeah. Um, yeah I can. Wow. But, Sometimes yeah, in life, Dom, you meet some people and you think you think they're like innocent or like good. In my case, how I met Nick was he contacted me, said, well, first I, I interviewed him about because I thought he had become sober. But then he contacted me, said, can I do a series on your show? Because my channel's not doing so well. It could help me out. I'm, I'm in recovery. So you sometimes in life, you encounter people you think are like innocuous, but then they turn out to be a, just a, you know, just a bag, you know, endless not, bag of chaos. I'm not going to sit here and, and I'm not going to bash Nick. I wish him well. Did he do a lot for me? 150%. That he did do. You know, made me a partner on the WC Trainers thing. Let me become a part of the CBD line. Um, brought me in the podcast. I'm grateful for what he did for me. Yeah. Did he make my business? No, he did not. But he did do a lot for me. And I do know what he did wrong to me throughout the past couple of years because I've seen proof of it. Um, so I'm not going to sit here and dig him. But, you know, he did uh, did do a lot for me, though. You know, mm. do I like him anymore? No, absolutely not. I have nothing to say about him. Um, mm. But he did do a lot for me at the time. Yeah, I still, I still like deep inside. I still think like he's a nice guy. I remember I talked to you about this before. I said like, is, is he a good guy inside or not? Because I couldn't tell. Sometimes I still get the feeling maybe he's a good guy. He's just so troubled. But oh, no, dude, there's no chaos. way after all those stories. Uh, Boston is like 100 percent certain that he has no ethical code whatsoever. Yeah, I get all the, I, I have all the emails of him taking people's money and ghosting. That's true. Yeah, it's true. It's true. All right, let's move on to a happier subject. Let's take a couple of questions before we let you go because I know it's it's been a bit longer than than usual. So um, it's cool. I have okay. still a ton of work to do anyway so okay so we have some we have an interesting one i thought dom would be good for so crypt of gore says what do you and we've had this question asked before but it's an interesting one what do you think about the current 200 milligrams of test trend wait if you don't know about this dom on youtube a lot of channels now mention starting your first cycle at 200 milligrams but they're talking about cycles they're not talking about like just going on trt they're talking about like do 10 weeks of 200 and then take a break for 10 weeks and then so that's what they talk about so here he says um Compared to the reckless forum days of the early 2000s, personally, I miss the experimentation of that era. Maybe it still occurs, but it seems like younger kids are far less eager, eager to hop on heroic cycles. So what do you think of the change? I don't know if you've seen it. Have you noticed that um, 
mostly because of YouTube. I think after Rich Piana's death and Dallas's death, people took a very conservative approach personally and then reflected that also in their videos. Uh, so the question is, are people more conservative now? Is what he's No, asking? the question is, what do you, do you miss the old days where people were reckless? I don't know if you were ever reckless yourself because you were in the proper bodybuilding world, but boss. Uh, you, know, you know what? Any steroid use is reckless. Let's be honest. We're not meant to take these things. Let's just say that out there. Um, but I did push things here or there. But was it like crazy over the top? No, but, you know, in the honest way, any steroid use is, is no good. Um, but I have to say... I guess because people are more honest to say and what I see with clients and stuff, people haven't really got any more conservative. No, I don't believe, you know, I'm also sus suspicious about it. I think it's mainly like novices on YouTube that are first trying things out are trying these. Yeah. They, do you notice that Boston? Are people more conservative? Dom's Dom's work with some heavy pushers. He's worked with FAC and he's also worked with fucking uh, uh, team, team cookie cutter Sims. <laughs> he makes up nicknames. Those, those, guys both, they, those guys both really like gear. Well, I mean, listen, I don't like I said, a, I'm still gonna work with AJ. You know, he's a great friend of oh, mine. He's good. No, he's good, but he he likes his he likes his orals and he likes his supplements for sure. Yeah, no, I mean I've I've seen some of the protocols he does. You know, this is bodybuilding too. I mean, I worked with Chad Nichols. Um, so I have have I pushed stuff hundred percent. I'm not gonna sit here and say I haven't. Um, but you know, with seeing people who come to me from other coaches or doing stuff in their own, people have not gotten any more conservative than years ago. People are, are pushing stuff more than ever. And, you know, I don't know if it, I, like I said before, it's a combination of a few things. People train like pussies. They eat in the off season, like pussies, they push diet and contest prep like pussies and the gear quality is just shit. Well, is the question now here's the question. Is it a pussification of a of an entire generation? Do we, is that what's going on is that the generation below us Greg, I'm wondering bro cuz they seem a little less tough like the or not oh, well, some of them are tough too like they're like in Chicago everyone's shooting everyone but they're like playing computer games in their head. They're not really like normal that's, people. That's I mean I think it's a generational thing. A lot of people want things easier. Um, I mean, not to get into the whole thing. Yeah. I mean, we see people not working on unemployment more than ever. Uh, we see people, you know, who just want to take more gear. Listen, you want to take more gear, go for it. It's your life. But at least go into the gym and push yourself. And, you know, the off season, <laughs> eat big, you know, file your plan, stuff like that. So, you know, I do see a lot of late. There are a lot of lazy people. There really are. Like, I mean, who needs a goal in the short term? Who needs this to do this? It's like, you know, just, you know, work ethic is not what it used to be, you know? Yeah, I think I think having everything available to us at a moment's notice, you know, even yeah. just the TV, the well, phone. That's, you know, it's crazy, Leo, because everybody has a phone. Everybody's on social media. Everybody is a coach these days. Yet people are less... Uh, people don't learn people don't look to learn more than ever it's like you know they just want to regurgitate what other people do they don't want to pick up books they don't want to go on the internet and take the time to read they just want to regurgitate what other people do or what they see in social media mm -hmm. and it's like you know that applies to all these coaches and then you know on the bodybuilder scheme of things mm -hmm. it's you know people they look for these crazy scientific ways of doing things and they just want to see if they can get away with doing the least. And, you know, that, that is showing. Yeah. And for the audience, if anyone's wondering about those people, the crazy experimentation people, well, they're not experimenting like the Z's days or the Boston days or, or rich days. But if you go to Dubai or Qatar or Saudi Arabia, you'll encounter a lot of people on five grams a day that are yeah. huge, that look like they have bad proportions or whatever. But in a shirt, they look like they could be Mr. Olympia. Tons yeah. of people smoking cigarettes going out partying on five grams a day. So there's a lot of people doing that. It's just probably different parts of the world. Yeah, no, I agree with that. It's not like that here in the U.S. anymore. Um, with like people looking like freaks, you know, and all this, they yeah. take a ton of gear and they don't look like freaks. Yeah, yeah, no, they look like freaks. They, they work out hard. I mean, they love what they do, you know. That's the thing. They just I don't have the genetics. Different cultures like, you know, in the Middle East and Dubai and Egypt and places like that, they are just naturally hard workers. I mean... Uh, and then combine that with good quality gear, which they have there, and they love to eat, and they have good quality food, and that, that's what you get. <laughs> that's true. Although I've been hearing that the gear in Dubai is getting worse, apparently. I think everyone's suffering from the China stuff. <laughs> but Okay, so there's an interesting question. Obviously, probably not heavy metal related, but Dima Renoda says, Love the show, Leo and Boston. I used to get some nasty pumps in the gym.
but notice that they aren't what they used to be. Apart from adding more gear, integrating insulin, or driving up carbs, carbs and sodium, what are some factors that could be contributing to my lame pumps in the gym? Are there any particular protocols you recommend? I'm only 34 and I've been training since I was 14. Thanks, Dave. So obviously it could be a lot of things because we just found out that mercury can do that, which nobody would have guessed. I would have had no idea. But uh, I have an idea. I don't know what you guys are thinking. How about how about higher body fat levels? I notice if clients get too high in body fat, they become insulin sensitive or insensitive. And resistant, yeah. And, yeah, and, and they don't they, they stop getting the pumps that they used to, like either like right after a show or mm. even in a contest prep. Dude, there's guys that all in contest prep and I'll just place carbs around workouts. And I mean, just because they're leaner, they'll they'll get better pumps than when they were full blown off season eating, you know, cups of rice in every meal and stuff like that. I think I think that's the biggest reason. So that's yeah, that's a big reason too. Is uh, I mean, it goes down to insulin sensitivity. I'm not telling people to check their blood sugar every 20 minutes, um, <laughs> but you know, your viz. <laughs> yeah, every 20 minutes is the key. Uh, but you know, the insulin sensitivity is a big thing because when you do get higher in body fat, it does go down, um, especially when you're eating high amounts of food and you're taking growth hormone. It does become an issue. So I would, you know, check their fasted blood sugar or and test it one hour after the first meal. Um, if that's not the thing, uh, if that's not the issue, obviously, boss, I said, lose some body fat. Um, but another thing I found, too, is hydration. Um, water plays a big part in, you know, pumps. Uh, electrolytes play a big part in pumps. Of course, sodium, potassium. Um, mm. Or, too, maybe they're just not eating enough. So it could be many different things. Mm. I had a feeling that was what Boston was mentioning. I'm just assuming because the guy's 34, both of you thought about the insulin resistance issue. So I've been insulin resistant before because I used to be an alcoholic. And when I was alcoholic, I had a very weird physique. No, I've, I've had many weird physiques in my life, but this one was very weird. My arms were like unusually small. Like I had had muscles since I was 17, but when I was an alcoholic, they wouldn't fill up. The shoulders wouldn't fill up. All the muscle wouldn't fill up as well. And you have the central adiposity, that visceral fat. So your belly sticks out, even though you don't have exterior fat. That's the clear, uh, visible symptom of insulin resistance. Visceral fat, like a hard belly that sticks out. And then less. the first thing that will happen is you'll get less glucose to the muscle. Metformin can help you with this, by the way. But um, so, by the way, Dom, the, the quickest way for somebody to test that really isn't just the fasting glucose. It's that oral glucose tolerance test that we're looking at on the biomarkers. Because you go into a doctor's office, you stay there two hours, they give you a glucose challenge. Then they check your glucose and insulin serum. And then they do the same at a, at a, at a 45 minutes later or an hour later. And that way you can see your insulin and glucose. So you can see if your glucose is controlled, but your insulin is overshooting which means you're in early stages insulin resistance. Is that what they do with the pregnant woman? They wanted Ariella to do, to do yes. that shit. Drink a yes. bunch of fucking syrup or some shit. And, then yes. and they hold you there for hours. Yeah, she did it. Yeah. Did she, was she good? Yeah, she was good. Yeah, because women often get diabetes when they're pregnant. My wife also did it. But you know what's funny? They did it for my wife and then they measured her glucose and didn't measure her insulin. I'm like, what kind of retards are you? Like you skipped the whole point of that. Huh? I was about to say that too, is aside from checking, you know, the A1C, the glucose is checking the insulin. Yeah. Uh, obviously, if you're pumping out higher and normal over, you know, that's not a good thing. Like that's a, that's a, big that's what happens out. first before you get in. Yeah, exactly. You that's first over secrete insulin, then something weird happens. We don't know exactly molecularly, but then the insulin keeps stop working and you get the high glucose levels because the insulin can't shuttle the glucose away. You know? A lot of people, you know, say they're bullshit, but I'm a very, very big believer in uh, glucose disposal agents, obviously good ones. Um, the first time I really seen how good they were was years ago. My best friend, Mike, he's type one diabetic and he was a competitive body, but he used to come and peel. Mm -hmm. So his diet was regimented. He had his insulin locked in. So, you know, the first time I really seen the GDAs work was with him. He was like, let's see if this fucking works. Mm -hmm. And it was actually with Matador. And he would always test his blood sugar and his insulin, you know, his basal insulin and his humologs went down, you know, pretty significantly through the weeks that went on. What kind of disposal agent was it? Which one? Uh, it's a uh, Matador by uh, Project AD. Oh, it's uh, a combination of cinnamon, uh, berberine, all that good stuff. Berberine that's, a good that's a good one. I use that too. Something else also that you lowers. Huh? You, you use it? I use Matador with the Ravenous if I'm eating a fucking shitty meal, yeah. Yeah, I mean, okay. I tell everybody, even if they're even if their insulin sensitivity is fine, I have them put it with carb meals to take the load off the pan. Yeah, less insulin. Right. You know, if you could get away with less, it's even better. 
Yeah. Although I tell you one thing, though, uh, Dominic, that theory, which Dave often mentions, Dave Palumbo, is incorrect. So there's he's often mentioned on his channel that how you develop diabetes is your pancreas is overworked, and then the pancreatic is isolate cells die, and the pancreas stops working. It turns out in most cases of type 2 diabetes, this is not the case. The way it happens is through insulin resistance. The pancreas is still producing insulin. The insulin is not working. So it's mm. you and usually you'll even see temporary changes to the pancreas, like a fat, fatty pancreas and so on. If you give someone a one week fast two two times in a row and then they eat once, then a week again, the diabetes goes away. So it can't oh, be the pancreas. Dude, since you mentioned Dave Plumbo, I got to bring this up. I don't, oh. I don't know if I told Leo this is insane. What? This is crazy. No way. I, I, ordered, I ordered the kidney stuff from Dave two days ago. Okay. <laughs> I order I, because it's, it's a good product, and for my no, kidneys, I, I, I'm doing no, everything I can, right? So I order it at night, right? <laughs> I wake up, and they canceled my order in the morning, just completely canceled it. <laughs> and, then, like, and I'm like, really? So then I, I just went to the website that manufactures it, and it goes that the, the, the website actually has free shipping, and Dave was going to charge me like 15 for shipping. So if anyone's watching this, go to the actual manufacturer. Shipping's free and it's, <laughs> and it's cheaper. So I Googled the kidney stuff and they have two different formulas. They have a capsule formula and they have a granular formula. I went straight through the site. It's free shipping. It'll save you money. Don't go to Dave's site. <laughs> <laughs> Bro, that's so evil. Like I canceled. So I know, I know it's his wife though. I, I know it's not him. Oh, okay. But listen, I want to comment on this. So three years ago or whatever, when I was arm wrestling and I was paranoid about my kidneys, I used to trust Dave and I didn't know much about, you know, this stuff. So I ordered this kidney stuff thing, but I'm not stupid when it arrived because I didn't know what it was and it's called kidney stuff. I'm like, what the hell is this? So I look at the ingredients in the back, bro. It's just a, a mixture of sources, a sourced vitamins and minerals that you don't know where the hell they came from and phytochemicals in a proprietary blend. It's literally a bunch of different supplements. It's like beans and stuff. Yeah, like random different supplements. I'm like, wait a minute, what is this BS? I, I don't know if it works or not, honestly. But, it, yeah, but I, don't, uh, I don't know if it works, but yeah. I have a few friends that said it. I've, I've been having clients use the uh, kidney stuff for years. Does it? Have uh, you seen a difference in the uh, blood work? I do, I do. Yes, I do have. A, I do have a, a dramatic story about somebody. Um, he was huge. I don't want to mention his name. I don't know if he wants it out there. Um, but uh, huge in Puerto Rico years ago, he became a client of mine. He worked with big name coaches. They kind of ignored his kidneys. Anyways, his EGFR, if I'm remembering correctly, was like 24. Creatinine was four or five. Um, and, you know, his past coaches kind of ignored it. And, you know, I was so reluctant on working with him. I don't even, I, normally somebody comes, I'm like, go to the doctor. I wouldn't do it. And for some reason, something told me to work with him. I'm not not looking for people to come to me to hire me for this. I won't even take you on. This was a one-time thing. Mm. And uh, it was pretty bad. And, you know, uh, protein in the urine, that whole thing, took protein completely out of his diet, you know, made the nutrition around, you know, kidney health and taking out what wasn't supposed to be in there. Long story short, a high dose of astragalus, up to like 20 grams a day, um, golden resources, kidney stuff, and then the other supplements. But I have used the golden the kidney stuff with all my clients and it does make a big difference. And I've used it religiously for a while. So the, so the question I was going to ask is if you ever used it without astragalus and whether, cause astragalus at 20 grams a day makes a major difference that you can use 30 grams of astragalus. Oh, good. You're using 30 now? 30. I, I scoop oh. it three times a day with my meals. Yeah. It seems I, mega doses are effective. I swear by astragalus. And in the lower doses, I use it with most clients um, you know, at, a, at a lower dose, you know, how like low did you get this guy's uh, GFR or how high? His, his guess what his gfr got up to 73 wow wow, wow. yeah so Dude. to this day and he's, you know, he's, in, he's integrated protein back in his diet he hasn't ran cycles again he went on trt and a low dose of growth hormone um but you know we made sure he was super hydrated two to three gallons a day of uh water all the supplements and everything to this day his egfr is fine his creatinine is a tad elevated um no protein in the urine none and uh, he's doing good. Like I said, I'm not looking for people to come hire me. I won't take you, but uh, I have seen it work. My, my GFR is at nine. Nine? Nine. My, my creatinine's at 7.57. Are you, you're off all gear, right? I've seen your test. Uh, I, I was off at all gear and when I had seven, but now I'm doing one cc a test a week. Yeah, I think you're fine one cc a week. At least it'll take some stress off your body from 
being all over the place. You're not using like Molly and stuff anymore, are you? No, no. But I mean, I will. I'll, I'll, I mean, dude. Yesterday, I IV GHRP six, and um, dude, Why I, I, I yesterday I IV GHRP six with my friend. And uh, I ate probably like 250 grams of protein. Oh, <laughs> oh that, I, I was going to say the only reason is to eat. Yeah. Well, so give, give yourself two months of no, the... Trust me, I did, I did everything for three months. No yeah, training, you no drugs. Your stragglers, no your, your stragglers, the kidneys. I've done it. Dude, you should see how many natural supplements I'm taking. I'm taking the stragglers, hibiscus. I'm taking like four Amazon kidney subs, Renadil. I'm on like the works. Yeah, but keep taking, keep giving, keep giving yourself time. Fuck the protein stuff like that. You never know, dude. Like with this guy, I mean, at six months he went back over sixty. Oh, I, I, I have faith because I feel fine. I'm symptomless. Good. Like just keep on. I'm glad to know you're fucking. You're off gear. You're low in the train. Everything like that. You're taking everything. Like I said, dude. I have a feeling you're gonna be able to jump back, especially since you feel good. Yeah. But just to be clear, to clarify, what my criticism of the kidney stuff. My criticism was this. So my idea, you know, if you guys don't know, I have two fridges in my house. One fridge is just for supplements. So I have a full size fridge for, for my supplements. So for me, I get every plant that I want or I think I need somehow. And I get it. I get a third party reviewed source of that supplement that I trust. Mm. Why? Because whenever I read the third party reviews, bro, half of the supplements are contaminated or half are underdosed. So I can't trust them. Right. So I take every supplement by itself. Now, if I was scared about my kidneys, you will bet you you can bet that I'm not taking a proprietary blend of supplements that I don't know. I will be taking every individual supplement that I know why I'm taking it. I know what dose I'm taking. I've read the studies on that to see what dose it is. I wouldn't put my life in somebody's hand that made a blend for me. Well, bro, if you made a blend, I can make a better blend than you can. I can read better than you, I'm sure. So like I can go through it. So my main issue was who made that blend? What's the evidence-based reasoning behind it? And where are the sources of this? You can go on their site. They have a bunch of stuff on there if you were if you're interested. interested. I might have mentioned, it doesn't mean it doesn't work because if you're taking antioxidants from food, you're going to reduce oxidative stress at your kidney, reduce inflammation there, and your numbers may improve. I'm, I'm sure many supplements can do that. I'm just saying like this blend thing was tricky. That was a big thing I did as well was antioxidants in the diet. For for the kidney, yeah, I know, yeah. yeah I, I tell Boston about top of my head what we did. It was a lot, but you know, you know, Boston just got disheartened, bro, because he he did his best and the numbers didn't change at all. And yeah, like I did everything for like three months, Dom, like no, like low ass protein, like everything they said, and it got worse. So I'm like, why am I not gonna work out and not do all this shit if I'm you know if I'm gonna get worse? Yeah, but but he so hasn't, but he just, hasn't, but he but don't get him wrong, he hasn't started like injecting grams or anything. Yeah, yeah, no, I know. I follow you guys. I know. This I like this what was that? If I started taking gear, I would feel like shit. That's how I knew something was wrong is yeah. because I was taking my normal gear and I was like puking every day. So mm -hmm. I knew something was wrong, you know? Well, that goes back to even like me with the mercury. I came off cycle for a while and I felt, I felt amazing. I even, I looked way younger. My skin looked great. Got back on site. I looked like shit. Now I'm just on a, a CC, a CC a week. And then plus the, uh, the GH, I actually just bumped up the GH, but that shows you a big thing, like the detox pathways and the kidneys, how much of an effect it have on it. Even when you don't plan on getting you know. back on stage. A hundred percent, a hundred percent. As long as, um, I can be at my best 150%. That's why I moved to Vegas was to get back into competing. Um, I wanted to compete this year. I just wasn't growing and nothing was happening. People think I wasn't giving effort over the last year. No, I was yeah. training religiously. I was eating all my meals. I was taking all my juice. You bet your ass on that. It, it's almost like the fucking mercury canceled out the effects of the anabolics. Oh, it did. Like, Boston, I had no sex drive. I didn't have a boner for months, even when I was on cycle. All well, my hormones are fine. My test levels are through the roof. Estrogen was, was in range. Everything was fine. It's like it literally just put a wall, let anything work. It was the craziest thing. Inflammation by itself, by the way, will inhibit sex drive sometimes if you're in very high states of inflammation. There you go. Yeah, I'm sure everything was going on. But listen, can you compete at your full, because you have a crazy genetic potential from what we could see in your initial shows. Can you compete at that level with the, with the back surgery? Because I know you did, you had a good back surgery, but does it, does it impede you in any way? No, not at all. No. I mean, I just squatted. I did legs for the first time in a while the other day. Squatted. I won't ever squat 600, 600 pounds for reps, whatever I did back then. But the thing is, I have the base. Yeah. So I just have to use when I'm healthy. I'm training again. I'm eating, but I'm not going to push gear for a bit. Yeah. Um, I know once my cells are working and everything is 100%, the muscle memory will kick in. I have that base, and then I could build up on that. So I could do bent over movements fine without any pain. doesn't hurt. 
Um, I got pretty lucky with that back surgery because it was really? pretty severe. But yeah, every week I barbell row now. I do T bar rows. You barbell row? That's yeah, crazy. No pain at all, as long as I'm strict. There's no need to even do those things. Honestly, they're not even that efficient. I I, I used to barbell row also, but I completely stopped. I won't do I'm, it at all. I'm a big believer in compound movements. I mean, I, I was barbell rowing 405, four plates. But tell that tell that to Ben Chow. <laughs> no, Ben Chow's our buddy now. Our buddy, he's our buddy. Come on. But I was bent over rowing a lot, but bro, I haven't even tried to do it because I'm thinking about it. Like I'm I'm holding the weight bent over. There is no way this is not horrific for my spine. Oh, it's it's a there's no way. Spine. It's horrible for your spine. So it's I'm horrible. like, I'm not doing it. But you're That's competing is different. I don't think I don't think you need to really go that heavy on bent over rows. It's heavy. No, as you, That's you, true though. Boston, yeah. you don't. You know, I just learned in like recently, not just recently, I've always known this. I just had an ego in the past. If your form is super strict, you're not doing 405. No, slow. hell no. Nobody. Hell no. You need Even to use momentum to do the best. You know, who, you know who's a good example is my client, Ross. He doesn't go over 185 on Barbara Rosa. His back is That's what I go to. Dude, you know, like, like my back's my best body part. 185 max on barbell row. Apparently, what Doug Brignoli says is that the middle back is just this movement. Like, if you move your shoulders forward, then you pinch them back. Yes, that's that's it. all it does. That's so, it. so the whole 405 bent over row is sort of useless. It's you could just be doing arms. this. Dude, I'll, I'll tell you exactly. All the guys that do heavy barbell rows, you'll notice that their biceps are more developed than their back. Yeah. I was like that. Yeah. My biceps overpowered my back. Yeah. In fact, I couldn't. Add, sometimes, if your biceps overly strong, you can't use the compound movements for your back. Your bicep will take a little bit it of it. It takes over. That's even with things with T wall rows. So that's been the cool thing with like hurting my back and mercury is all the learning I've done from it. Like, you know, and my health has been complete dog shit, but I've learned a lot about the body and then, you know, the back surgery, different ways of training the back and learning how to really squeeze it. And, you know, it could, uh, I'm definitely going to come back. And I really, really do believe as long as my body functions 100% after this, then I can be, you know, reach my genetic potential. Because, because you're younger than just for the audience to realize. Because you look in your 30s, you're not. In, you're you're 28, I think, right, or 27. Yeah, 28. I, I just look yes. like I'm 40. So he's <laughs> younger. Wait, are you then? You're the same age as as the uh, Nick Walker. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So you're very young. I remember when I Dominic, I was like, I was super. I was like two years older than him. Yeah, I'm two years older than him. And I was following team bodybuilding back then. And like, like right before him, he he, he was like. That's when it was good. You remember it was fucking yeah. Cody, Cody Lewis, uh, Nick uh, Medici, Nick all Medici. those guys were coming up. Yeah, that team bodybuilding back. You had Steve Kukla was a great team bodybuilder. Um, you had so many guys. I mean, you had full bodybuilding shows at Team Nationals. Now yeah, it was crazy. Fighters. Dude, I feel like the teenagers are better than some of the guys in the open national level now. It's crazy. Now, yeah, and that's that's it's crazy because even the teens today, they don't touch what the teens were about. No, hell no. So it, it could be, dude, it could be gear quality. I mean, it really could be. Well, you know, there was a, uh, uh, you know, I'll name him. He's fun. Thackeray always told me, he goes, you know, you better train your fucking ass off. You better eat big. But gear quality, and even what I've seen with clients, will make or break somebody. Okay. I've seen you know, I've seen somebody who trains hard and eats and they look okay. And then they change gear to a good quality source and they just morph, um, you know, not only with size, but with the hardness of the muscles and the details. And then, you know, big things with antiestrogens today, people just think that they can go take a UGL antiestrogen. Oh yeah, it's good. Cause my friend says it's great. And it's junk. Oh, it, it's, actually, a game -game. it's good. You bring this up twice in the same podcast, because actually I just remembered, I have a, I have only four coaching clients, monthly guys, just four guys, but one of those guys, recently had a symptom of gynecomastia and I told him to take, well, I didn't tell him, I suggested that I would take 20 milligrams of Novadex for a few days while I reduce estradiol. Bro, he just does this three days later while he's on the Novadex and Aromacin, he gets the thing come back. He's like, it's like tingly on his, on his nipple. I'm like, that can't happen, bro. If you're on 20 milligrams of Nova, real Novadex, like breast cancer patients use that. It's 20, it's not 30. So it totally inhibits growth. I mean, you won't feel a tingling. It may stay there, whatever grew, but prolactin, it's probably prolactin. I don't think it's probably, he's not using any progestogenic kind of compounds or anything. I think the Novadex is fake or underdosed. It could Genuinely. be because there's a, I mean, UGLs usually have Novadex is pretty easy for them to get. And sometimes, yeah. you know, the, the raws are pretty good. The dosing may be off, but people who use these underground aromazins and aromadex. Oh, the AIs are more, more fake than the Novadex? Oh, oh big time. 
like big time. Like the thing too is how, yeah. how are some of these UGLs going to put one milligram in a pill? The, you know, they don't have, even if a lot of them are bad with the pill presses That's and true. making capsules, but a lot of the raw is coming from China for Arimidex and aromas and are no good or the dosing just way off. All my prep guys, it's mandatory. Either all day chemists or clear sky farmers for ancillaries. It has to be farm grade. Only farm grade. I tell them I don't want anything else for farm grade, especially in prep. You know, you guys are very, you know what the sad thing is? A, na- a nation can never maintain its independence if everything it consumes is from another country. Like, you realize our military would be vitamin deficient if we didn't import vitamins from China for the military. So, like, our whole society, it's it sucks. You know, we used to produce things. I read a lot of history. In the early 1900s, America used to produce things for the world. It's a now, very different world we live in. If, if, for whatever reason, if we were to totally cut off you know, shipments from everything from China to here, we be we done. Medicine no. comes from China. Everything comes from no. China. Everything. Let me tell you. Let me tell you an interesting thing. Not many people know. After World War II, a lot of people nowadays they think they talk about the Japanese, one of the best economies in the world, but the Japanese were completely decimated in World War II. How did they develop this crazy economy? People are like, oh, they're just so hardworking and stuff. They did it intelligently. After World War II, they shut down Japan from international trade. To force the country, despite famine and hardships, to force them to develop their own companies. And I believe that that was the beginning of what developed their greatness. They have a very diverse, multifaceted economy. And they did this by banning imports. Many people don't know about that. We're doing the exact opposite. But anyway. and then, Yeah, we are doing the exact opposite. We're seeing, you know, it hit our economy. And then, like I said, with gear, gear is all turning horrible now. Too bad we can't produce gear. Yeah, I wish we could. But that's no. another point as well, back to the gear thing. If you look at the guys in the 90s, every single, in the early 2000s, almost so early 2000s, every single thing they used was from a pharmaceutical company. Mastron, Parabol, and everything was pharmaceutical. There was no underground labs. Dom, didn't you start using it like 15? Uh, well, I don't want to put the age out there because of the young, <laughs> young views, but it was definitely wasn't 15. No, because I, no, I remember you won that teen show. I think like one of the Atlantic shows when you were like 16, right? No, oh, I, was, I was 16. Yeah. Yeah. I don't I don't think we have young listeners because I put it like to not to be over 18. But uh, oh, really, I wish I, mean, I, I tried. Huh? I wish I started at 16 like you did. <laughs> oh, man, I was so close to using. I'm not that I could have been a bodybuilder, but I was so close to using gear for my powerlifting at 16. And I made a decision against it. And then you and I never grew further because I, I didn't want to I wouldn't want to be short. It turns out I didn't grow a single centimeter after that <laughs> and nothing happened. And then like five years, six years later, I tried. But I mean, I, I don't I don't regret it so much, but I was very close. It would have been really fun, to be honest. It would have been good for sports <laughs> in high school. I mean, oh, I was 100 oh, percent. Oh, for sure. Did you did you play sports also in high school, Dominic? Yeah, I played uh, I played football from when I was really really young all the way up to my sophomore year of high school i got into bodybuilding because i started i was going to be the fullback going to sophomore year and mm. i started lifting weights for football and then a couple months in I'm like fuck this i'm gonna bodybuild one day <laughs> my first That's- month of training i put on 30 pounds i wasn't like clean or anything it was sloppy yeah. but uh I put 30 pounds i'll never forget eating everything in the lunchroom were you like low body fat naturally no i was always yeah i was oh, always really? i guess you, i wasn't like fat but I was I was pretty chunky. Yeah. Ah, so you gained both fat and muscle easily. Oh yeah, I remember one year I wasn't even allowed to do the. Uh, there was a travel team, I think, going to eighth grade for football because I was over the weight limit. I didn't even look fat. I was just <laughs> I was always just a bigger kid. How tall are you? Uh, five nine. I think. Oh, okay, was. okay. Yeah. So you got to not let us down when you when you get fully recovered. You got to go compete with that new new cohort of bodybuilders. Nick Walker and Ian, all these guys. We got to have our own guy in the mix. I'd be curious. I'd be curious to see who he's going to use for for prep because he's pretty. You've used Aceto. You've used all the guys. Huh? I've used everybody. I'm definitely. I'm definitely going to use AJ because uh, you know me and him. We have we have a good relationship. We never have been able to do a prep together. Well, 2017, I was going to come back with him, and I put in a crazy amount of size on. I got lean fast. I like how he responds to me. We have a good system, and I want to see what I look like truly peeled at like 240, 250. I think I'll be at like 240s. I was supposed to be at the New York Pro and that didn't happen. Uh, just peeled and full because I was never 100% full and I was never 100% peeled. Yeah. You look peeled in the your pro, uh, not pro debut, but when you won your pro card. Uh, yeah, I mean, I guess I was in pretty good condition, but yeah, um, I, I mean, like even far beyond that, I want to be. 
Oh, like a Shelby kind of condition. No, whatever. whatever. No. <laughs> I want to be. I want to be pretty peeled. But yeah, I definitely. Uh, Not that I'm peeled. In, I'm, I'm in the right mind state. You know, I'm. I'm focused. I um, finally have my love for it again. I have the fire back. I've had it for a while. It's just been the health issues. And if, you know, I'm hundred percent and my body can function, I'm hundred percent going to compete. I like to get to Olympia one day. Yeah. You deserve it. You're very hardworking. Know, and positive uh, just something. I'm not saying I'm going to win the Olympia or anything. I just want to get there one day, you know, cause it's something I want to do since I was a kid and it'll be good for you know all my businesses in the future. And, you know, it's something I want to do for myself, you know, yeah you're crazy young man i mean you haven't even peaked yet so i'm sure that if that's a goal of yours you can get there yeah that's will... the thing. as long as long as i can do it in a, as healthy manner as i could and you know and i be at my best and i'm gonna go for it we'll be cheering you on well dom i'll let you guys go because i've got some stuff to get to but it was such a pleasure to talk to you dom we got to have you back on i really think you fit the vibe of the podcast don't you yeah, agree boss no. I'll, uh, I'll come on any time for sure. Yeah, right. we, me and Dom have always gotten along. I mean, we've, we've gone back and forth with numerous topics. I feel well, like we agree on a lot of stuff. The funny thing is I had scheduled with Dom to talk to him at 7 p.m. tonight. And then without telling me, he scheduled with you to be on the podcast. Well, and I'm like, I, I, we're having I, two Dom I, calls. I messaged him because I, cause I was like, you know, would be a good guest. Because you remember, I, I've been getting on that, that kick of getting good guests, right? Yeah, you are. It was a good. It was a good choice. It was just funny, coincidental that he t- just talked to me. I thought when Boston hit me up, you hit him up. No, I had no idea. Better. He was doing oh, it independently. Okay. He just wanted to be on the show. Yeah. <laughs> Pretty funny, right? All right. Anyway, anyway, Dom, I'll let you be, brother. Thanks for, for doing the public service, though, bringing this up. I hope people can, you know, be aware of the, the, the minor levels of having higher levels of these four heavy metals can harm your health. You know, it's yeah, not just... No, it's a much, I mean, I could have gone even more in depth. Yeah, like, like imagine, but imagine, Dom, imagine your symptoms never got that bad to where you had like severe, you know, depression and stuff like that. And it was just bad enough that you didn't really realize. I bet there are people listening to this, to the podcast that are like that. No, there are, because I've spoken to a few through uh, Instagram and, you know, they've turned out they had it. So, you know, doctors don't recognize it. Um, It is, you know, out there on actual medical journals that psychiatric disorders are misdiagnosed. Meanwhile, it's the mercury. Mm-hmm. Um, and you know, there's things I could go into with statistics of vaccines after 1993 and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, there's a lot to go into that people don't talk about. It's a big effect on this country, uh, more than what people think. Interesting. We should talk about the vaccines next time. This will be interesting. So the, yeah. I'll send you a podcast on that too. There's an interesting podcast on it. Anyway, guys, I'll let you be Boston. I'll see you soon. Yeah, see you All right, brother. Have a good night. Mm-hmm.